please, now you have to sit down immediately. Now, please be seated. And we start. But before we begin, may I ask the formal adoption of the draft agenda of this joint committee meeting? Yes, the agenda is adopted. And now we move to the report by the OEC PA Special Representative on gender issues. And I call Mrs. Heidi Fry to introduce her report. Heidi, where are you? I'm here. Good. Good. You are welcome. The floor is Mrs. Fry. You can pass. She's not. Right. Please respect. Monsieur le Président, chers collègues, comme toujours, c'est un honneur et plaisir pour moi de vous adresser aujourd'hui. But it is also with a mixture of sadness and some frustration that I present my report on gender issues in the OSC today. I think that as we look back to 20 years ago in Beijing, it seems that in a generation, the issue of gender equality still remains very elusive. Every time we take two steps forward, we seem to take one backward. Parliamentarians, you, we, are among the most influential people in the world. Men and women look to us to be able to improve their lives, to give them hope, and to alleviate the suffering and the discrimination that they face. We cannot and must not fail them. Gender is a goal worth striving for. Gender equality is extremely important to the future of the world. I want to update you quickly. Ten years ago, as you well know, there was an action plan set out, the 2004 Gender Action Plan of the OSCE. It is now 10 years, and in December in 2014, uh, in Basel, the Ministerial Council tr tried to bring forward two very important resolutions. One was a, a, the addendum to the action plan for 2014, and the second one was combating violence against women. Unfortunately, the draft addendum did not reach consensus, and so we do not have a draft addendum to the action plan. And we know that some member states have wanted to regress. They have wanted to weaken the commitment to gender at the OSE, to restrict the scope of gender, and to actually roll back promotion and achievement of gender equality. And I think it's very important for all of us as parliamentarians to make sure that we do not allow this to be, to continue and to be effective. The Council, therefore, as a result of not having consensus, adopted an agreement that, parliament, that the participating states would finalize a gender plan by 2015 and then present it to the Permanent Council. Well, I need to tell you, I don't need to tell you that we're now two months into 2015 and this has not yet been initialized and we urge the Serbian uh, chairman in office to actually move forward very rapidly to deal with this issue. What the Ministerial Council did do at the OSC was adopt a plan for preventing and combating violence against women. And they are asking participating states to develop certain clear guidelines and a certain clear framework to make this happen. And one of that is a legal framework. And the second one is to look at preventing violence, to protecting victims of violence, to prosecuting and to create partnerships with others to ensure that violence against women is actually no longer truth. But the point is we know that with conflicts going on in this region and in the OSCE and in the Mediterranean region, that in fact there is greater violence against women at, in society, uh, in displaced persons camps, as refugees. And we see that in fact um, a lot of organized crime has in fact improved and increased its influence around the world, taking advantage of conflict, taking advantage of disruption in order to achieve their goals of, of, of making women victims of rape, women as victims of trafficking. And so I think we need to remember this and we need to do something about it. Now, 
Now, I just want to tell you what my plans are for the luncheon, the gender luncheon, and where we should be going as a parliamentary assembly in this coming year. I think I would like us to actually begin to realize that with 20 years after Beijing, when we have moved so little, that the most important thing for us to do is to develop measurable goals for gender equality, to develop tools, and to actually have a strategy and a structure. It's not good enough for me to stand here and for all of us to agree that we need to achieve gender equality. I think we have to look back and say 20 years later, after Beijing, we have still not achieved women's rights as human rights. And so I I want to look at three themes that I want you to think about between now and the luncheon in 2015. We want to enhance in the three dimensions of the OSCE. We want to enhance, for instance, the economic and environmental di dimension. We want to strengthen women in the economic spheres. We want them to participate fully in the economic life of their country because we know that, in fact, when women participate fully, you get 51% of your resources participating. Your own nation state becomes stronger economically. It is able to compete uh, in the global scene and is able to complete in a global environment. And I think this is something that we must do. We cannot afford as nation states that are struggling right now to ignore this 51% of our population. I also think we need to look at how we develop mentoring for women in economic spheres. We know that women still do not have access to financial, uh, any financial aid, that we do not have access equally to banks to get them loans to become entrepreneurs. They need access to education, to skills, to training, and they need to look at property services. Many women do not have access to property in the OSCE still. And we need to look at some of the areas in which women are not able to participate at all in the environmental sphere, and that is in terms of places like construction work and other very untraditional jobs for women where childcare and the ability to have parental leave is a very important part of them. And I think it's really important for us as we look at how women can participate in the economic life of their countries, we need to look at issues such as health and reproductive rights. It's important for us to look at how we develop good legislation, but legislation is not enough. We need to look not only de jure at the actual intent and principle of the law, but we need to look de facto as how those laws can actually achieve what they are meant to achieve. And I think mentoring and leadership and work Working with businesses to partner in doing that is one of the other things that we can therefore do uh, to help women in the economic sphere. We want to talk about strengthening the human dimension. That's the second part I want to discuss. We see an increased number of women in politics, but it's not enough because their influence is still not being felt. And we need women to be able to influence good legislation and to be able to influence some of the policies that will allow for that legislation to, to move forward. We need to have women in decision-making processes because when we have more women in politics, what we found is that women understand that gender is not just about women. Gender is about ensuring that both men and women have the ability to overcome whatever barriers there are. And when we do good gender-based analysis, in other words, when we analyze what is happening with men and boys, we see that men and boys are not achieving the educational attainment that they used to in the past, and so we need to pay attention to that because it is about giving men and women equal opportunity and I think this is really important when, to, when we look at how we get women into politics we all talk about it but we still do not have good representation of women and as I look around this room I see more women than we ever used to have but I think we still need more and we need to build women's caucuses across political lines in our national assemblies so that they are able to actually influence change I think we need to look at flexible family and, and very family friendly parliaments where women are able to bring their children and have childcare, where women are able to participate and men are too. Younger men with children are wanting to spend more time with their families and sometimes being a politician doesn't allow you to do that. So as we move forward with gender equality, we actually get men and women moving together in the same direction. And finally, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, how we get efficiency and effectiveness in the OSCE. 
And to do that, we need to actually welcome some of the changes that the OSC has made. They've had attempts to integrate gender uh, into the structures of the OSC in the Secretariat. And one of the things that I know OSC has been trying to do is to streamline and strengthen by combining the current office of the OSCE Gender Advisor with that of the Chairman in Office Gender Advisor, so that we have one group working together and looking horizontally at the areas in which they must, they must actually play a role. But we did not achieve consensus of the OSCE in making that kind of structural change, and I'm urging you to go back to your nation states and to your parliaments and get your governments to agree to this. I think if we achieve uh, efficiencies, we will become more effective in what we would like to achieve. So I want to let you know that the OSC is in fact incorporating a deployment, or have incorporated the deployment of a gender advisor on its missions in Ukraine and in some of its work on anti-terrorism. Because as I said yesterday, we're now seeing women joining and being radicalized into terrorist groups. With a gender advisor on the anti-terrorism force, we will look at how we can find out what is causing women to do to do this, why and what are the effective strategies we can use to prevent them from becoming radicalized because the strategies are going to be very different from that of men. And finally, we need to look at how, with a gender advisor, when we look at how we monitor in Ukraine, we are beginning to look at how some of the issues in Ukraine, some of the human rights violations are actually applied to women and how women are suffering and how we can deal with it. Now, finally, I think I want to tell you that as parliamentarians, there's much that I want you to do. You have to speak up. If we find that today, the 20th anniversary this year, 2015, of, nine, of the 1995 Beijing United Nations Declaration, where it's a shock to most of us that for the first time everyone in the world agreed that women's rights were human rights. A mere 20 years ago, we agreed on that. And we have not achieved it. It's been a generation since we have actually tried to achieve that, and we still found that women, women's rights are not human rights, and that some countries of the world are still blocking this. The women, women's reproductive rights are not accepted in the world. We as parliamentarians are the ones that women and men depend on to speak for us. We come from them. We are elected by them. And I am urging you as parliamentarians to become very activist in ensuring that another generation does not go by before before we see gender equality and before we see men and women actually having their human rights observed, having the ability to participate fully in their nation's future at every level, whether it is political, economic, social, or cultural. And I'm depending on you to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. This is right. This it was excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have already how many? We have seven seven names on the list to speak in this debate. Yes, seven names. But that's not enough. We have sixty. We have sixty names, sixty people on the list to speak in the special debate on Ukraine. <clears throat> and now I understand that, uh, that we have the rules to follow, and it means that, uh, that I have decided to impose a time limit of two minutes. Time limit of two minutes. So that as many people as possible can speak in the debate, and in the debate on Ukraine as well. So thank you for your understanding. And now <clears throat> the debate is open. And the first speaker is uh, Mrs. Rosa Asnavadova from Kyrgyzstan, to be followed by Mrs. Valentina Leonenko from Belarus. Aknazarva, Kyrgyzstan. Уважаемые коллеги, я хочу выразить госпоже Фрай за очень важные моменты, которые отметила она по гендеру. 
по истечении Пекинской платформы действий истекло время, и мы должны оценить, что у нас сделано и что не сделано, и по каким причинам. Кыргызстан прошел значительный путь в совершенствовании гендерных достижений. Достижение равенства во всех сферах жизнедеятельности, обеспечение равных возможностей. В целях выработки механизмов по усилению роли парламента в достижении гендерного равенства в рамках взятых международных обязательств и интеграции гендерных вопросов в проекты и программы, реализуемые совместно с международными организациями, 15-16 мая в Бишкеке мы проводим международную конференцию на тему «Роль парламента в достижении гендерного равенства в контексте Пекин плюс 20». Проведение конференции нацелено на обзор достигнутых результатов, чего достигли или чего не достигли, по каким причинам у нас не достигли, и также по укреплению и дальнейшее совершенствование гендерного равенства, а также совместных поисков возможных путей, для устранения и практической реализации, которые сделаны в Пекинской декларации, усиление гендерной повестки в рамках формирования целей устойчивого развития на период после 2015 года. Важно нам необходимо создать условия для усиления дальнейшего наполнения сотрудничества новым и конкретным содержанием, провести обмен передовым опытом в области достижения гендерного равенства. Также мы проводим еще следующую научно-практическую конференцию, которая будет проходить 31 марта на тему «Парламентская демократия. Уроки и перспективы». Детальная информация о проводимых наших мероприятиях будет направлена всем членам делегации в самое короткое время. Мы ожидаем ваше участие в работе наших международных конференций про Проводимых Бишкек. Просим вас подтвердить наше, ваше участие до 2 марта 2015 года. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you and look at the time limit. Congratulations. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Mrs. Valentina Leonenko from Belarus, please. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги, дамы и господа. Республика Беларусь придает большое значение обеспечению гендерного равенства, о чем красноречиво свидетельствуют цифры. В Беларуси женщины составляют почти 55% в общей численности занятых в экономике. Среди государственных служащих женщины составляют 68%, среди руководителей 47,6%. Упомяну, что э, женщины возглавляют у нас в правительстве два министерства. Кроме того, э, женщина у нас сегодня является вице-премьером правительства, курирует вопросы развития здравоохранения, образования, культуры, спорта и туризма, социальные вопросы. Неизменно высока доля женщин. И в нашем парламенте э, уже стало традицией, когда порядка 30% депутатов – это женщины в парламенте. Одним из приоритетных направлений для нас является совершенствование национального законодательства в сфере борьбы с насилием в отношении женщ женщин и детей. В настоящее время... Разрабатывается концепция закона о предупреждении насилия в семье, рассмотрение которой планируется в мае 2015 года. Наши усилия направлены не только на развитие национальной гендерной политики, но и активное участие и международное сотрудничество, в том числе и в рамках ОБСЕ. В декабре 2014 года специальный представитель действующего председательства Председатель ОБСЕ по гендерным вопросам Джун Цайтлин посетила с визитом Беларусь, в рамках которого состоялись интересные беседы и встречи в национальном парламенте. Белорусская сторона готова и далее вносить практический вклад в деятельность ОБСЕ по продвижению гендерного равенства, в том числе и в рамках парламентского измерения. Благодарю за внимание. The next <coughs> speaker is uh, Mrs. Milu Tamali Gil from Turkey and uh, followed by Mr. Muhammad Alam. It's a 
Diyar from Afghanistan. Now the floor goes to Turkey. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Madam Fry for her uh, contributions and efforts about gender equality. Dear colleague, five days before, an atrocity took place in my country. Özgecan, a young girl of only 20 years studying in university who had plans for the future, was brutally murdered. Her mother said at her funeral, she was a homeless girl. She was too favors for everyone about everything. She wanted to open her own practice as a psychologist when she graduated. She was all, always working, always successful. Unfortunately, she couldn't reach her goals. A brutal murder was committed by a man. He tried to rape her. The girl resisted and in the end, he killed her, cut off her hands and burned her. Today, millions of women, mothers, daughters, girlfriends, wives, sisters are subject to violence all over the world. They are being killed, beaten, punished, raped most of the time just because they are women. They are even treated as slaves by terrorists. Violence against women is not just physical. There are women who are jobless, who work unreported, who struggle to survive in poverty and starvation. Women, women who are oppressed and crushed under harsh social rules. Nearly one in the three women suffers abuse worldwide. At least half of the women who were murdered lost their lives because of domestic violence. They are exposed to violence in their families or relationships. They feel hopeless because they have no place to escape to. Half of these violence victims don't report these crimes because they are anxious about their future if, today, if they do. We should support each other to have better representation in all parliaments. We should see more female presidents, prime ministers, ministers, executives, scientists, and lawyers. We should also more women in decision-making position. If governments don't act decisive, dec decisively for this issue, we should assume the responsibility. Arguments, protocols, laws must turn into something more than just ink on paper. We should constant constitute bodies for inspecting the implementation of such regulation. We should monitor the implementation of regulations of women's rights to observe groups as we observe election. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Mr. Echedayar from Afghanistan and the next one Mrs. Aslanova from Azerbaijan. Um. بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم جناب رئیس حیات محترم خانم ها و آقایان خوشحالم که در این نشست مشترک اشتراک می نمایم و فرصت یافتم راجع به یک موضوع خیلی مهم یعنی حقوق زنان صحبت می کنم از خانم هیدی فرای به خاطر گزارش جامعه شان تشکر می کنم صحبت من خیلی کوتاه خواهد بود تنها به برخی مشکلات و دستاورد ها و چالش های عرصه حقوق زنان و تمامند سازی زنان در افغانستان اشاره خواهم کرد سیزده سال قبل افغانستان و جامعه جهانی سفر مشترکی را با هدف مبارزه با توریسم جهانی و تأمین ثبات و امنیت پایدار در افغانستان آغاز نبودند یکی از وجوه مشخصه سیزده سال گذشته افزایش توجه به وضعیت زنان بود است زنانی که بیشترین رنگ را در زمان طالبان متحمل شده و از ابتدایی ترین حقوقشان محروم بودند در اصل قرون گذاری مهمترین دستاورد تطوین قانون اساسی جدید در سال 2014 می باشد 2004 می باشد که حقوق بشر را به عنوان عنصر اصلی برجسته می سازد و حقوق برابر و دسترسی به عدالت برای تمامی شهروندان را تصریح می کند به اساس قانون اساسی جدید مجموعه از قوانین تدوین و یا اصلاح شده است که به صورت مستقیم و یا غیر مستقیم بر حقوق و آزادی های زنان تاثیر می گذارد که از جمله می توانیم به قانون مهر خشونت برای زنان و همچنان قانون انتخابات اشاره نماییم که برای زنان در پارلمان شورای ولایتی افغانستان سهمیه استثنایی را مشخص ساخته است.
تلاش ها و دستاورد های عمده ما در اصل نهاد سازی شامل تاسیس وزارت امور زنان تاسیس واحد های جندر در ادارات تاسیس کمیسیون حقوق ب... مست... کمیسیون مستقل حقوق بشر و همچنان ایجاد اداره مربوط به مهر خشونت علیه زنان کمیسیون عالی مهر خشونت علیه زنان و واحد های دوسیه های فامیلی در حوزه های پلیس و ایجاد خانه های امن می باشد افغانستان همچنان در زمینه الحاق به کنونسیون های حقوق بشری و گزارشگی راجع به روند اجرای آنها تلاش های قابل توجه انجام داده است که از جمله می توانیم به تصویر کنونسیون محو تمام اشکال تبعیض علیه زنان و ارائه گزارش توحید اول و دوم به کمیته مربوط اشاره نماییم افغانستان همچنین تلاش های را جهت اجرای قدنامه شماره 1325 شورای امنیت ملل متحد و تدوین یک برنامه عمل ملی برای زنان انجام داده است چیل فیصد از تعداد بیشتر از ده میلیون شاگرد, شاگرد در کشور دختران می باشند زنان دارای مناسب مهم سیاسی در حکومت ما هستند و 28 فیصد کرسی های پارلمان را راجع به خود اختصاص دارند رهبران حکومت وحدت ملی متعهد شدند که چهار وزیر کابینه جدید را از زنان معرفی نمایند توانمندی زنان از جمله تهیه یک برنامه ملی توانمندی اقتصادی برای زنان بخشی از برنامه اصلاحات را شده به کنفرانس لندن راجع به افغانستان در ماه دسامبر سال گذشته بود پارلمان افغانستان نیز متعهد است تا با استفاده از صلاحیت های قانون گذاری و نهایتی خود به بهبود هر چه بیشتر زنان در افغانستان Спасибо, уважаемый председатель. Хотелось бы выразить слова благодарности в адрес госпожи Фрай. Ее многолетняя деятельность является примером для нас всех. И сегодняшнее обсуждение еще раз показывает, настолько актуальна сегодняшняя проблема гендерного равенства в пространстве ОБС. Как считают эксперты Всемирного экономического форума, ни одна страна мира пока не достигла полного равноправия между мужчинами и женщинами в экономике, политике, образовании и здоровье. Однако каждый сторона достигла определенного уровня развития. Азербайджан также имеет исторический опыт в области предотвращения дискриминации в отношении женщин. Я могла бы многое рассказать об Азербайджане, о той работе, которая проводится в Азербайджане. Скажу только одно, что уже около 10 лет действует закон о гендерном равенстве, о предотвращении бытового насилия и так далее. Сделано очень многое, но самое главное посмотреть в завтрашний день. И поэтому в 2012 году своим распоряжением президент Азербайджанской Республики дал поручение подготовить концепцию развития Азербайджан 2020 год взгляд будущее и обеспечение гендерного равенства в качестве стратегической цели настоящего и будущее нашло отражение только что госпожа Фрай говорила о многих актуальных проблемах которые должны решаться вот как раз эти моменты и нашли отражение в этой концепции концепция э, обеспечения гендерного равенства на праве и развитие семьи. Будут в Азербайджане приняты соответствующие меры по решению гендерной проблемы, которая будет оставаться в центре внимания. Основными направлениями государственной политики в этой области будут осуществление мер по предотвращению случаев гендерного насилия, создание равных возможностей для женщин и мужчин на рынке труда, расширение возможностей для карьерного роста женщин, назначение их на руководящие должности. Будут придержаны усиления социальной защиты и охраны матери и детей, упрощение присмотра за детьми для работников, работающих родителей. И хотелось в конце сказать одно, чтобы уложиться во времени. В 2014 году в Азербайджане прошла выборы в муниципальные органы. И как отрадно сказать о том, что женщина в этот раз увеличилась по сравнению с показателем 2004 года в 9 раз. Это, мне кажется, очень отрадный, очень положительный момент. 9 раз увеличилась Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And the next speaker, Olga Belkova from Ukraine, and the, the next after her will be Grant Mitchell from Canada. So, Thank you, Mr. Belkova. Chairman. I thank Dr. Fry for her comprehensive report. Over the past 10 years, OECE structures have been working very hard to assist states in in preventing and combating violence against women. At the same time, OSCE should continue to promote inclusion of men in gender equality issues, as well as to encourage addressing violence against men and boys in order to break the vicious cycle of violence, as many of the perpetrators of violence against women have previously been victims of sexual and domestic violence themselves. As parliamentarians, we should promote gender equality at our assembly and other international institution. In this regard, I am pleased to inform you that after the last parliamentary elections in Ukraine, the number of women in Verkhovna Rada, our parliament, has grown. And for the first time in the history of independent Ukraine, a woman was elected as a vice speaker. At the same time, I regret to inform you that our brave colleague, Nadia Sarchenko, for more than two months, is on Higer stri uh, strike in Russia. We strongly insist that the Russian authorities will fulfill the promise given in Minsk on February 12 and will release Nadia Sarchenko as soon as possible. In terms of the situation of the, in the east of Ukraine, women constitute 66% of all internally displaced uh, persons, 31% uh, are children. In terms of conflict escalation, which is observed during recent weeks, the number of IDPs is growing rapidly, and according to the last, uh, latest UN data, the number has reached over 1 million people. That's very sad news. The issue of medical support and psychological rehabilitation for women and children victims of the, con on, of the conflict still remains. We are interested in organization of joint initiatives with the OSCE to prevent violence against women and children in the conflict. Many women report feeling overwhelmed by the magnitude of their daily tasks. A lot of children are di displaced from their schools. I would like to conclude by thanking for the support of the OSCE and, uh, in Ukraine and assisting Ukrainian authorities in raising awareness about gender equality and finding particularly practical tools to help our people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the next speaker, Grant Mitchell, Canada. Thank you, Chair. I want to begin to th by thanking Dr. Fry for her important leadership and presentation in this important issue area. Colleagues, my remarks address the importance of educating women and girls. Globally, fewer girls than boys attend elementary school. The higher up the educational ladder we get, the fewer girls continue to be enrolled. Two-thirds of the world's illiterate adults are women. Girls represent approximately 60% of illiterate youth. Lower female literacy rates, low quality employment, and restrictions on the ability of women to fully participate in the public life of their countries are just some of the consequences of failing to educate our girls. Girls and women from minority communities, including indigenous girls and girls from Roma and Sinti communities in OSCE countries, face intersecting forms of discrimination and additional barriers in accessing education. Ensuring that girls and women have equal access to education is one of the best, most effective investments that we can make to accelerate development worldwide and to ensure comprehensive security. Equal access to education without discrimination is a fundamental human right. We must encourage our countries to adopt clear strategies for women and girls' education. We can increase public support for women in scientific activities, and we can support efforts to improve the collection of data we need to assess progress and formulate policy on e equality of access to education. Colleagues, I urge all of us to push our governments to redouble their efforts to ensure that all girls and women around the world have a chance to go to school, have equal access to education. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, now the debate is closed. And uh, I ask if uh, Mrs. Fry, 
wish to respond to the debate? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, President. I, I wanted to thank everybody for their interventions, and I think that most importantly, we need to consider how far or how little we have come 20 years after Beijing. I think this is a year for us to think about what we are doing to help 51% of our population achieve that ability to participate fully in the life of their nation's growth, whether it's economically or otherwise. I think the points made with regard to violence against women is, was made very clearly by many of you, and I want to congratulate um, Senator Mitchell on his points on access to education and to skills and to training, because if women can play their role in society, we will be stronger for it. And we will have a full participation of 100% of our people. I think that the important thing to remember is that women are not only marginalized in many, in many places because they're women, but they're marginalized based on their ethnicity, <coughs> they're marginalized based on their, on their race and on their language. And we have got to remove those barriers and we have got to speak strongly against discrimination based not only on gender, but in some of these other issues. So I want to thank you and I hope that it means that you will speak out in the summer, that you will come up with great ideas, and that we can move forward to measure where we're going, to set out indicators, to find out if we're getting there, and to be able to decide that we want to reach very certain targeted goals within the next five years, at least here in the OSCE nations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very valuable contribution to our, to our meeting, and thank you for your valuable visions also in, 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 the, in the floors you, you used here in, in our debate. Thank you very much. And now <coughs> we move to the special debate on the OEC respond to the crisis in and around Ukraine. And uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, closed the list. We have 60 members who have registered to speak in this debate. So it means that I will be very, very strict what concerns a limita time limitation of two minutes. And, um, and I'm not sure if all of those 60 speakers will, will have the time to do it, but, but anyway, we will, try, we will do our best in, in, every, in, in various ways. But today, <coughs> dear friends, we have need to consider what our organization has done, what it can do tomorrow, and what it should do to respond to this crisis in the long run. There is uh, anyway some hope in the air for the diplomatic solution today, to take hold and uh, for certain violence, violations of the OEC principles to end as they absolutely must. The Minsk package was made possible through the leadership shown by the German and France, Germany and France, and we all thank them for their efforts. But we all know that there have been ceasefire violations from the start. The SMM reported just hours ago that there was intensive shelling in Donetsk city today. As parliamentarians, we must be very decisive in furthering the goals of peace in and around Ukraine. It's um, clear that that kind of talks, rebels, leaders claim that uh, the ceasefire doesn't apply, apply in certain areas or the OEC monitors are not given safety guarantees and full access are not acceptable. Let's also consider today the idea of an international peacekeeping mission in eastern Ukraine which could complement the OSCE's current work in the crowd, on the ground. Let me also remind you that, uh, that uh, what we supported in Paku last summer 
the creation of an interparliamentary liaison group on Ukraine. Today I remain anyway hopeful and will continue my efforts in order to implement this decision. Now, I very warmly welcome our introductory speakers who have worked so hard for the diplomatic solution on this crisis. We all know how busy they have been, but we appreciate very much their work. And, and uh, let me introduce our speakers, key speakers, esteemed guests, uh, guests here in Vienna today. First, we have Ambassador Kopieraci, the director of the OEC Conflict Prevention Center. Welcome. Then we have Ambassador Apakan, the chief monitor of the OEC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine. And uh, we are waiting for somebody else. He will, she will be the big surprise for for the for the uh, annual meeting. So, but. Uh, it's clear that uh, we can't forget Crimea. That's, that's for sure. We cannot, it, it cannot be forgotten. And another one speaking point on my list is the humanitarian aid to the eastern Ukraine. This is also another basic question in our minds. That's a horror situation in there. So, but um, now we turn to our speakers for their remarks before hearing from you, the OECD parliamentarians, your uh, opinions and, and your commitments to the process. Ambassador Kobier Raci, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Distinguished members of Parliamentary Assembly, the European Security Order is severely the European security order is severely stress-tested. Uh, 2015 is likely to be a year of classic geopolitics. Predictability will be an exception to the rule, and foreign policy will be extremely challenging. With hindsight, it seems clear that the crisis in and around Ukraine is a symptom of a larger security crisis that has been emerging over the years without being fully recognized. A striking factor of the Ukraine crisis is the absence of common ground or a shared perspective from which to interpret it. The narratives of East and West diverge in unprecedented ways. This is the big picture. I should like now to zero in on the role of the OEC Conflict Prevention Center and on the situation in Ukraine which requires our immediate attention and action. At the risk of stating the obvious, the crisis in and around Ukraine has dominated our agenda and is likely to do so for some time to come. The CPC found itself in the thick of the developments from the very beginning and has contributed greatly to shaping the OEC's response. Ever since the crisis started to unfold, the Conflict Prevention Center supported the chairmanship and its special envoys on Ukraine. The CPC established and led an internal secretariat-wide task force which was charged with planning and preparation for rapid setup of a field presence and a project on the national dialogue. When on 1940, on Friday 21st March, the Permanent Council adopted its decision on the deployment of a special monitoring mission to Ukraine, I'm proud to say we were ready. By the morning next day, Saturday, 22nd March, an advanced team had started its work in Kiev. Only three days later, the first teams had been trained and deployed to all ten locations agreed in the mandate. At the request of the chairmanship and pending the appointment of the head of the mission, Ambassador Apakan, I was appointed acting head of that mission. In that context, I would like also to recognize OEC Parliamentary Assembly efforts, your strong support for the SMM, and statements by the PA and the President of the PA are very much appreciated. When the Berlin Declaration on the deployment of OEC observers to the Russian-Ukrainian border was adopted last July, we immediately proceeded with establishing this, the newest OEC field presence. 
Signatories of the Minsk package agreed last Thursday on a ceasefire. As you will know, the SMM was called upon to monitor this fire, uh, to monitor the ceasefire, and Ambassador Apakan will update you on this, on the monitoring activities uh, in a minute. Whilst the international community is mindful of creating any new lines on the map of Ukraine, the lines of most frequent ceasefire violations are fairly clear from the data collected by C monitors, as well as from other sources. Hotspots include several areas around the communications hub of the Balceva and north of Luhansk. The dilemma that we at the OEC, and especially our colleagues on the ground, are grappling with is this. In the absence of an essential catalyst, political will, what sort of small steps can and should be taken? The SMM will be shortly reaching its authorized strength of 500 monitors. Supported by quite sophisticated technical means, such as uh, UAVs, they will continue to be the eyes and ears of the international community, providing objective information and regular assessment of the implementation of the Minsk package, not just to the AC, but also to the wider public. The SMM, supported by the CPC, representatives of my team visited Kiev more than 50 times last year, will also continue to engage with all actors on the ground including with members of the so-called DPR and LPR, in order to enable us to operate throughout the entire Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, and with the aim of facilitating local dialogue and agreements. Still, progress at the higher political level is essential. No amount of small fixes and partial successes will stop the conflict, even if with full recognition for the efforts of SMM monitors on the ground, they can and do reduce human costs and suffering. Hence, the immediate priority is clear. The fighting needs to stop. Holding signatories of the Minsk package to account and establishing a durable ceasefire are critical. Yet, this is only the beginning. Rebuilding trust and re-establishing the broken lines of communication and rebuilding the economy in Donbas will have to follow. Dialogue at local, regional and national levels can make an important contribution to reconciliation and national cohesion in Ukraine. The OEC, with its wide-ranging toolbox, is well placed and ready to promote such processes in Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed about your valuable contribution to our meeting. And uh, now we move forward. We call Ambassador Apakan, Chief of the Monitor, Chief Monitor of the OEC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine, which is very important action, of course, from our side. Ambassador Apakan. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Distinguished members of the Parliamentary Assembly, at the outset, I have to thank Ambassador Kobrechki, because who was the acting uh, head of the mission on, during those critical days while we were trying to establish the team in Kiev and the number was 20, and within one month's time, it moved to 100. We are a civilian mission, and uh, we have 10 teams in Ukraine, in the, in the West and Eastern Oblast, and our basic function is monitoring and verification functions. At the same time, the verification of uh, human rights, minority rights, basic freedoms. We also conducting dialogue and facilitation. During the developments of events, I have to say that the nature of the conflict moved also from a political one to military one as well as to a humanitarian one. 
And today we have almost nearly 6,000 people who lost their lives because of the crisis and nearly 15,000 people have been wounded. The conflict has also left over 1 million Ukrainian citizens in eastern Ukraine homeless and put them into a internally displaced persons. And a great amount of them, nearly 60% of them women, 30% of them children, and also elderly women, elderly men. They need help. They need attention. Ukrainian government is doing its uh, best, but the international community uh, should be helpful to them. I wish to underline the human dimension of the Ukrainian crisis, sir. Also, 60,000 persons became refugees. They moved to, according to UNHCR, they moved to Russia, Belarus, Poland, Moldova, and Hungary. Five months ago, all sides agreed on the need for a ceasefire and to refrain from engaging in further armed action. The Minsk Protocol of 5 September and Minsk Memorandum of 19 September, building on President Prochenko's peace plan, formed a viable framework for re-establishing peace and stability in Ukraine. I should also add that the Geneva Joint Statement between US, Russia, Ukraine, and European Union, as well as Berlin Declaration of 2nd July between France, Germany, Russia, and Ukraine, as other documents which which have been adopted in order to contribute to the peace process in Ukraine. As we entered 2015, our mission once more saw a deeply worrying upsurge in fighting and fierce battles, especially for control of Donetsk airport and the Belchova. We tried to do local ceasefire in the case of Donetsk Airport, in line with Minsk documents, we have not been successful. And I should say that since the mid of December, the military activity has been intensified in the region. And particularly in the case of Donetsk Airport, which has been followed by the Belsova, our concerns and our disillusionment with the military activity in the region really has been significant. That's the reason we welcome the initiative from the Normandy Head of States, their declaration the head of states of Germany, France, Ukraine, and Russia adopted an important declaration. We welcome it, sir. We also welcome the package of measures for implementation of the Minsk agreements of 12 February. There are 13 provisions. They are all interrelated. They represent an integrated whole. However, against this background, during the first days, the ceasefire appeared to be largely holding, giving a desperately needed respite to civilians trapped in the area. As days have gone on, gone on the situation has once more developed in a worrying direction. Now, we have, as you have kindly underlined, the facts, current facts in eastern Ukraine, we received reports of fighting in and around the Belsova. Also, Donetsk City, around Donetsk Airport, Holivka, Shirokina, in Luhansk, shelling has been heard in Shastia, Nova Adar, Pervomaisk. These are the places which we have observed shelling 
at the moment, today. When the things moved in the wrong direction, I asked my deputy to go to the region with a team. My deputy, Alexander Huck, has been bought in Donetsk airport as well as recently in the Batsova in order to provide local ceasefire. We also spoke to GCC, Russian-Ukrainian Joint Control and Coordination Center. We also spoke to the representatives of DPR and LPR in order to have an access to the region. Because we were trying to achieve, you know, a ceasefire in the Batsova and around. But I should report to you that DPR has denied our access to the region. We asked them to stop the, uh, to stop the offensive, but we couldn't get a result in our efforts. Our efforts have been lasted almost three days. So what I would like to say, for peace, ceasefire is a priority. And also, withdrawal of heavy weapons is another priority. But I should underline that these 13 measures are all important. And we are waiting for an early implementation of these 13 points, sir. And I should say that we need cooperation by the signatories of Minsk document. We need the continuous support of Normandy powers. We need full access. As far as I know, Normandy powers are working in order to be helpful to us in achieving uh, access in all parts of eastern Ukraine, including the hot, hot spots. Our number is going to reach soon to 500. We have shifted some of our monitors from the west to the east in order to, to be helpful for the full implementation of ceasefire. Of course, the new zone which has been laid down by the Minsk document is a big area. We have to upgrade our capability, more qualified personnel, experts who could be helpful to us in monitoring the, this huge area. So technological capacity have to be upgraded in order to combine our human resources as well as technological capabilities in order to achieve a full implementation of ceasefire. In that respect, I have to thankful to our Serbian chairmanship, to the Secretary General and colleagues, also to Ambassador Heidi Talibiani. We are very, on a, on a daily basis, coordinating with each other. I have to say that the support of parliamentary assembly is also important to us. We value your support, support very much. What I would like to say here, means package is important. It's a means process. They should not be differentiated. They should not put into, they should not be even, you know, that this means, that means, means is one. We need to ensure the implementation of means packages. I do believe that uh, President Prochenko's peace plan is also provides an important platform for, for, the, for bringing a solution to the Ukrainian problem. I should also say that our job is to deal also with human dimension, with human crisis. We will be focusing more on women issues, children. They are also suffering. Two sides of Ukrainian people are suffering. We have to be helpful to them. They look for peace. The role of OEC is important. So I will reiterate my call again for full implementation to ceasefire and early implementation of the mixed document. And we have to ensure 
the stability and normalization of Ukraine. That's my mandate, which has been given by the Permanent Council. I thank you for your attention, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We have heard two most vital speeches in Europe today concerning the crisis in, in Ukraine. And you also noticed that what is uh, perfect timing, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, entrance of, of Ambassador Heidi Tagliavini, uh, who is uh, one of the architectures of the, of the Minsk deal of last week. And now we have the great pleasure to invite you to, to give your floor to our assembly. You are most welcome. I'm already finished. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you for giving me the floor. Distinguished members, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to the assembly where I see a number of friendly faces, known faces, for having this opportunity to address you today. Let me start with stating that there is not a single day in the Ukrainian conflict when we can feel sure what the next day will bring us. There is even the frequent fear that the situation in eastern Ukraine may completely get out of hand. At the same time, we understand that we should not give up and should continue to work with all our hearts for peace. Let us hope that the recent fighting, including the attacks on the Balcevo, was only a deplorable incident on the way to the implementation of the Minsk Agreement, although it was a very serious and tragic event. And we do not accept to look the other way. We shall open our eyes to reality, a sad reality. What we saw in the Balceva and what we continue to see all over the eastern part of Ukraine is not an abstract of facts, figures and declarations. It is first and foremost a situation of human tragedy, of sons and brothers being killed, of families torn apart, of widespread destruction, of the plight suffered by refugees and displaced persons, of broken homes and shattered dreams. And it is not just Ukraine or the eastern part of Ukraine. It is a conflict that may put into peril the full structure of security and cooperation in Europe, which was initiated in Helsinki 40 years ago and which gave this organization and this assembly its name. We seem to be at a crossroads now. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no doubt in my mind that the fighting in and around the Balcevo and some other places following the ceasefire effective since last Sunday was a violation, a serious violation of the ceasefire agreement reached in Minsk only a short time before. At the same time, we do believe that the Balcevo will not bring an end to the Minsk agreements, including the most recent declaration of the four heads of state and government and the implementation package of 12 February 2015. We shall as adamantly as need be, insist on the full implementation of the Minsk agreements. In this context, we feel particularly encouraged by the ongoing contacts among the heads of state and government who were present in Minsk. There is also work to be done at the trilateral contact group and elsewhere. We had a meeting of the trilateral contact group and consultation, consultations with representatives of certain areas of, Donetsk and, of the Donetsk and the Lugansk regions last night. And we were able to discuss humanitarian issues in the conflict zone, including the release of prisoners, in particular prisoners of war, and related, relating to the urgent needs of the civilian population in the war-stricken area, meaning medical supplies, food and shelter. We also discussed the role of SMM 
in the conflict zone and the right for freedom of movement in the whole area and access to all places. Of course, we also raised as prominent items the complete cessation of fire at all places with the agreed withdrawal of heavy weapons. I welcome the ongoing elaboration of practical steps and timelines to that effect, and I encourage those who are working jointly on this task, both from the Russian and the Ukrainian sides, to complete these tasks in the shortest possible time. The success of their work will also be proof of the continued relevance of the Minsk agreements. Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, it is our hope that our joint efforts for, peace pro for the peace process will make it possible to come to a point that will enable us to implement also those parts of the Minsk document that need a more stable political and military environment for their implementation, as we have it now. In this context, I would like to draw your attention to point 13 of the implementation package signed in Minsk on the 12th of February, where the signatories commit themselves to intensifying the work of the trilateral contact group, including through the establishment of working groups on the implementation of relevant aspects of the Minsk agreements. We have already devised an outline for this purpose including responsibilities and workloads of such working groups. And I would be happy if it would be possible to reach the stage of them being set up and the beginning of their practical working in a foreseeable future. However, this depends on a substantial improvement of the situation on the ground. I mean the full respect of the ceasefire provisions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude my remarks by recalling what I said at the beginning, that we are at the crossroads and that we need firm action in order to prevent the Ukraine conflict from spinning out of control. It is my deep belief that we have the means, political and moral, for doing so. I urge you to join in in this effort. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador Tagliavini. Thank you very much indeed. And now we move forward. And uh, I want to tell you that when we are going through the list of the speakers, we go further and further. But any time our key speakers want to comment, take the comment and make the intervention, that's up to them. And they just let me know when it's time to, to, to to give the contribution to the, to the discussion. So, due to the fact that uh, it is a question about, uh, mainly it's a question about Ukraine, uh, we start by Mr. Artur Gerasimov and uh, to be followed by Alexei Pushko from Russia. The first speaker is Artur Gerasimov from Ukraine, please. Dear Mr. President, dear colleagues, first of all, we would like to extend our gratitude to Ambassador Talevini, to Ambassador Kubiratsky, and Ambassador Apakan for their valuable reports as well as to express our appreciation for the CPC and SMM activities in responding to the crisis stemmed from the Russian aggression against Ukraine. What I want you to stress your attention to. While the so-called Ukrainian issues is one of the many issues that demand the attention of the international community, it's my sincere belief and conviction that the issue we have at hand is the issue of Russia. And this issue will define the future of the current international system. The international order, as we know, it is being put under tremendous stress. And whether we like it or not, the international system is undergoing rapid and profound changes that are the direct result of the Russian occupation and annexation of the Crimea and the Russian hybrid war against Ukraine, the visible part of which is being fought these days in the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. 
There is a very real danger that further escalation of the situation will result in additional human deaths and suffering. It will also lead to the further undermining of the ancient formula, Pacta Sunt Servanda, which forms the very foundation for the conduct of relations among states. Barely a week ago, the marathon negotiations in Minsk resulted in adoption of the package of measures for the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. And we already see unscrupulous attempts on part of one of the signatories, the Russian Federation, to twist the agreed provisions and to abdicate itself of the responsibility to implement the undertaking commitments. Ukraine is bidden fully by the Minsk regions and is committed to their meticulous implementation, while our armed forces are observing the agreed ceasefire. The Russian masters brought their puppets into Donetsk and Luhansk regions to further escalate the situation with continuous shelling of towns and villages and innocent attacks on Ukrainian armed forces positions. The question arises, is the Russian Federation sincerely interested in ensuring the sustainable ceasefire, withdrawal of heavy weapons, exchange of prisoners, to all of which it agreed in Minsk? So far, it's not evident. I would like to draw attention of my distinguished colleagues present here to some simple and obvious facts. It's the Russian Federation that occupied and annexed Crimea. It's the Russian Federation that undertook the systematically destabilized the situation in Ukraine and started a hybrid war against my country. It was the Russian Federation that sent its regular armed forces units and mercenaries to fund the flames of war in the eastern Ukraine. It was the Russian Federation that organized a continuous flow of weapons to Ukraine into the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. And it was the Russian Federation that violated practically all norms and principles of international law, including those enshrined in the Helsinki Final Act. And truly speaking, Russian Federation caused the greatest crisis in Europe in the recent history. I am saying it's not to point fingers or to assign blame. I am saying it to remind all of us to keep focus on the underlying cause of the current crisis, namely Belikov's aggressive and irresponsible Russian policies. Just remember it when in your parliaments the issue of relations with Russia or sanctions against it or any other related matter comes up. I count on your acting responsibly and with full understanding of the consequences. And last but not least, uh, Russian Federation repeatedly telling that uh, Russian tanks, Russian military equipment is not present in Ukraine. And let me pass to Russian delegation and to, to you, Mr. President, numerous facts with the documents about presence of Russian military equipment or Russian tanks and Russian military ammunition in Ukraine. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, then we move to the next speaker. He is Alexei Pushkov from Russia, followed by Mr. Hans Franken from, from the Netherlands. Thank Mr. Pushkov, you, Mr. please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will not adopt the same tonality uh, of debate as was taken by our Ukrainian colleague. I think this tonality will lead us nowhere. Believe me, we have a number of things to uh, say about the actions of the Ukrainian military forces and National Guard in East Ukraine. Uh, the a large majority uh, of the people who perished in East Ukraine, and this is only on official figures, uh, more than 5,500 people, are the victims of the Ukrainian shellings of peaceful cities. And this cannot be uh, neglected and rejected. This is a fact that was corroborated by a number of uh, international commissions, United Nations human rights, um, uh, uh, human rights um, uh, reports and, and uh, some others. What I want to say is that uh, we think that there is no alternative to the Minsk agreement. Uh, I agree with Mrs. Talevini that the fighting and shelling uh, will uh, and should will not and should not uh, bring an end to the Minsk agreement, because the only alternative to this is to return uh, to violence. Uh, 
Uh, we also, I think, have to reject the black and white picture of the events there. While uh, there is a tendency in uh, some countries to blame the uh, uh, militants for everything that happens there, they are routinely also blamed for the violation of the Minsk agreements. It is also true that the shelling of Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, which are happening today, are clearly the responsibility of the Ukrainian military forces. There is nobody else to shell Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, as for the insurgents, today uh, they have offered to the uh, OSC mission to visit Debaltsevo. Of course, uh, the security conditions for this have to be created. As soon as they are created, the missions will be um, uh, led to uh, Debaltsevo. Uh, I would like also to point out that the fulfillment of the agreement is the task of all sides uh, who signed it. Russia cannot be considered as the only country responsible for the implementation of the agreement. It is a, a joint responsibility uh, which lies also in Germany and France, who are also the guarantors of the agreement, and they should use their influence to uh, influence uh, Kiev uh, in order to take all necessary uh, actions for this. And uh, I think the most important thing now uh, is uh, to uh, remove all heavy artillery and missile systems to agreed distances, and in this case, the shellings will stop. In our view, the task of the OSC is to support the efforts of the Normandy 4. Uh, an important step would be to start the workings of the uh, interparliamentary group uh, on the context on Ukraine. The decision on the creation of this group was taken, as we all know, on the Baku session. Unfortunately, since that time, the workings of this group have been blocked by Ukraine and some other countries. We think that the Minsk agreement gives uh, a very a uh, good opportunity to restart this uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, uh, we think that uh, we should uh, do wh what is necessary uh, to support the initiatives that, uh, uh, as we know, uh, the uh, chairman of the Parliamentary Assembly of the AC uh, is uh, uh, ready to uh, undertake in order that the parliamentary, uh, interparliamentary group on Ukraine can start its work in the coming future. It will help a number of things. It will help to create a better political atmosphere for the fulfillment of the Minsk Agreement. It will be a parliamentary follow-up for the efforts of uh, uh, the uh, Normandy 4. It will uh, signal that the parliamentaries uh, are not just debating, accusing and pointing fingers, but are do something practical uh, in order to move the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. And finally, it will help to rebuild trust, because uh, the uh, trust has been uh, really one of the main victims of the crisis in Ukraine. So I urge you uh, to support the restarting of the work of the Interparliamentary Group uh, on Ukraine as an, one of the most important trust-building measures in today's European politics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and as you can notice, uh, two minutes in Kiev and two minutes in Moscow is uh, something else, but it doesn't matter in this case. But now we will follow the li time limitation, you understand easily. So that the next speaker is uh, Hans Franken from the Netherlands, Netherlands and uh, Mrs. Marie-Francois Petch-Telly Petch from France will be followed. By Thank you, Chairman. That. Almost 70 years after the most horrible war that devastated our continent, a war <clears throat> that was only finished by the common will of the peoples of the UK, France, the Soviet Union and the United States of America and their allies, we see again a tension on the European continent that is very near to a serious war. Nobody of us is willing to have a new battle on our continent with many casualties, with pain and sorrow, with destruction and hunger. Now regarding the state of the existing conflict, we fully support the activities of the German Bundeskanzlerin and the President of France to work together with the Presidents of the Russian Federation and of Ukraine to agree about measures to take the first steps to end enmity and alleviate tensions. The leaders of these countries deserve our respect and gratitude for their joint efforts to put an end to civilian victims and to de-escalate the conflict. 
Now, Chairman, it's our task as members of parliaments from Vladivostok to Vancouver to support by parliamentary diplomacy the first steps taken by the leaders of Europe on the 12th of February. First, to immediately stop the bloodshed. Second, to respect the legitimate borders. Third, to give the OCE monitors free access to pursue their work in an objective manner. Fourth, to prevent impunity for those responsible for the shooting down the Malaysian airliner flight MH17. And to give Ukraine the chance of building up a democratic, independent state that will have good relations with all the countries on the European continent. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> and look at the timetable. Yes, thank you very much. And the next speaker, Mrs. Uh, Marie-Francois Petstel from France, followed by Mr. Michel uh, Ungerer Nö from Romania. Please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je suis très frappé par la tonalité relativement optimiste de nos débats si je les compare à ceux de l'année dernière au même endroit. Je pense pour ma part qu'il faut absolument, comme cela a été dit fortement par la plupart des participants, appuyer le prolongement des accords de Minsk par tous les moyens dont disposera notre organisation pour faire suite au format Normandie. Mon pays, vous le savez, a pris toute sa part dans cette... Euh, il a considéré qu'il avait une responsabilité historique. En ce moment même, la chancelière allemande et le président Hollande viennent d'achever un déjeuner à Paris où la question de Minsk a été à l'ordre du jour. C'est dire que nous sommes disposés par tous les moyens gouvernementaux et parlementaires à prendre notre part. Je pense que l'OSCE doit en effet ranimer ou, ou continuer à animer le groupe de contact de Bakou. Elle doit pousser à ce que l'observation du cessez-le-feu, comme il vient d'être dit, soit faite dans les conditions les plus objectives possibles. Mais au-delà, il est sans doute de sa responsabilité d'imaginer la solution politique euh, qui sera celle du véritable statut de l'Ukraine, qui reste une question ouverte plus tard, une solution politique qui, encore une fois, euh, est nécessaire, elle est même vitale et nous devons tout faire pour exclure aucune solution militaire. Mais encore une fois, j'ai l'impression que nous avons quand même progressé depuis l'année dernière. Je vous remercie. The next speaker, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Mr. Ungur Renan from Romania, followed by uh, Mr. Keke Ham. Mian from Armenia, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Romania fully supports a peaceful resolution of the crisis in and around Ukraine in full respect of the international law and for Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, unity, and international integrity. These are fundamental principles enshrined in the UN Charter and Helsinki Final Act, which must be respected by all countries. Romania strongly condemns the illegal annexation of Crimea and Sevastopol by the Russian Federation and will not certainly recognize it. Full and urgent implementation of the Minsk Agreement of September 2014 and the package of measures for the implementation recently agreed is essential. The package offers a way forward a comprehensive, sustainable and peaceful resolution to the crisis in eastern Ukraine. We call therefore on all parties to adhere to the provisions of the Minsk Agreements and the package. The OSCE has responded quickly and professionally to the crisis in and around Ukraine, reconfirming thus its relevance. The special monitoring mission plays an important role on the ground, and Romania has a substantial contribution in terms of monitors, that is 22. The SMM has a vital role to play in the implementation of the Minsk agreements and package. Moreover, the SMM should continuously monitor the Russian-Ukrainian border, while at the same time the mandate of the OSCE observation mission in two Russian checkpoints, Bukovo and Donetsk, should be extended and expanded. We value the information provided by OSCE missions. We welcome the ODIHR readiness to monitor local elections in certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk regions, which should be based on Ukrainian law and OSCE standards. The occurrence of a new protracted conflict in our vicinity 
must be prevented. The security and stability in the region is already marked by the belt of frozen conflicts in Moldova, Georgia, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Our efforts to resolve the crisis in around Ukraine with full respect for its territorial integrity, sovereignty, unity, and independence must be coupled with resolute action to resolve the protracted conflicts in the Black Sea area in full respect of the same principles. We will continue to support the European and Euro Atlantic path of our neighbor country, Ukraine. Ukraine should continue the advance of reforms Two in the constitutional area, judicial area, and promoting good governments, ensuring the rights of persons belonging to national minorities. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, Mr. Greg Hamian from Armenia, and then Mr. Slutsky, and then Mrs. Uh, Hopko from Ukraine. Буквально несколько часов назад почетный председатель парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ Ранко Кривокапич сделал очень интересное и глубокое заявление, сказав о своих взаимоотношениях с уважаемым Ивицей Дачичем. Десятилетия назад они были по разные стороны баррикад. С тех пор пролилось очень много крови, кровь 100 тысяч человек, в том числе 10 тысяч детей. Сегодня они сотрудничают. Нормальные партнерские отношения, суть и мораль в том, что если рано или поздно все равно нет альтернативы миру, можно прийти к общему знаменателю, надо сейчас обуздать войну. В этом духе было выступление Николая Ковалева из российской делегации, несмотря на некоторую эмоциональность, вполне понятно, было и выступление Аркадия Герасимова. Каждый из них тоже хочет мира, но у каждого из них свое видение достижения этого мира. А между тем колюч есть, и этот колюч предоставили наши великие лидеры, не побоимся этого слова, в лице канцлера ФРГ, в лице президента Франции, президента России, президента Украины. Поэтому все наши помыслы и действия должны быть нацелены на одну вещь, чтобы минские договоренности получили бы реальное воплощение. И в конце своего выступления... Хочу напомнить проповедь великого понтифика Франциска I, с которым он выступил 4 февраля, назвав происходящее на Украине братоубийством. Стал бы знать священный долг обуздать войну. Спасибо. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, then Mr. Slutsky from Russia. Спасибо, уважаемые коллеги. Мы э, сегодня вместе с украинской делегацией аплодировали нашим базовым докладчикам, включая посла Итугула Атакана, главу спецмониторинговой миссии ОБСЕ и госпоже Тулевини, которые говорили о том, что сегодня важнейшие задачи – прекращение кровопролития и э, своевременное получение жителями Юго-Востока Украины гуманитарной помощи. Сегодня мы обязаны создать полноценное парламентское измерение а, процесса а, а, мирного урегулирования этого гражданского конфликта. И а, действительно, это задача, которая по силам парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ. Сегодня лидеры четырех стран нормандского формата приняли важнейшее решение в поддержку а, комплекса мер по выполнению Минских соглашений. И э, мы уверены, что все стороны конфликта все добросовестно приступят к реализации положений в соответствии с обозначенными в документе сроками. Я не буду сейчас э, долго говорить, те, тем более всего две минуты, о том, что не российские орудия сегодня обстреливают Юго-Восток Украины. Катастрофическим было решение официального Киева отказаться от э, стола переговоров и перейти к силовому э, решению проблемы. Сегодня именно на официальном Киеве лежит ответственность за э, гибель сотен мирных, э, мирных жителей, включая стариков, женщин и детей. Сегодня наша первоочередная задача – поддержать предложение председателя Государственной Думы Сергея Нарышкина, при, э, то, что было принято нами в Баку по, э, Минской парламентской группе, э, по Бакинской парламентской группе. Уверен, что мы сумеем в Лансвайлере, как нас приглашает госпожа э, Дорис Барнет, руководитель парламентской делегации Германии, прийти 
к э, первым шагам по запуску этого важнейшего парламентского механизма. И не позже летней сессии в Хельсинки Thank мы you. сумеем его запустить. Для того, чтобы действительно помочь минскому формату, для того, чтобы действительно сыграть ключевую Thank роль you. как подлинная организация по безопасности и сотрудничеству в Европе в плоскости парламентской дипломатии в немедленном yeah. прекращении этого кровопролитного конфликта. Спасибо. Thank you. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Mrs. Hanna Hopko from Ukraine. Dear colleagues, I would like to ask to uh, switch on the, to switch on the PowerPoint presentation. Today, I, if we want peace, we have to say the truth. The truth, the truth is the following: that there is a Russian aggression against Ukraine, and there are the military troops from Russia Federation, and they are increasing the number of tanks and heavily artillery to Ukraine's territory. And as a mom, mother of four years old daughter, I would like today to attract your attention to the deaths in Ukraine. Look at this picture, at these children. This is the Stepan Chubanko, it's 70 years old. Football player, arrested and ex executed by the NR. Also Mustafa Jamil, you've seen him yesterday. And this is the picture of Mykola Bobelov, his wife, his daughter and three years old grandson went under the shelling in Mariupol. They all died by the house. Also, this is the story that made me crying, because this is the three years old child. His mother tried to cover him to protect to, from shelling in Kramatorsk. And the mom was died, killed. And he's, he is in critical condition in hospital now. And there are lots of other stories. So I would like to raise your attention to Ukraine, because this is the human catastrophe. And if we not stop Putin by, by trying to do our best and understanding that this war, without saying the truth, to solve this issue will be almost impossible. And for Ukraine and our nation, it's very important to have peace. Ukraine and our president, we are a peaceful nation. And starting from the Maidan, the dignity of revolution, when we fight against the regime of Yanukovych, against Putin's wish to be a part of customs union, Ukraine is a part of Europe. And now this is the Europe's responsibility to stop Putin, because Putin invaded Ukraine. And it's very important to have the security and peace in Europe, because this is not the crisis of, in Ukraine, this is the crisis of Europe. And how yeah. many deaths you need more to stop this situation in Ukraine? Yes, thank th you. Thank you, thank you very much. <coughs> Next speaker is Mr. Kent Harstedt, followed by Mrs. Barbara Bartus from Poland. Kent, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, <coughs> dear colleagues. The Minsk agreement are in place. It's now up to the parties to do their utmost to fulfill the commitments as stipulated. However, the violence continue. As we heard today, uh, the violence have moved uh, away to other places, and the epicentrum of some of this violence is now east of Mariupol. There must be an end to the violence. It's up to the parties to respect the spirit of the Minsk agreements. We have many reports about what is going on. During the last 24 hours, we have reports of continuing, um, uh, continuing that weapon, ammunition, volunteers, so-called volunteers or fighters, are continuing to pouring in from Russia into this separatist area. It's rarely productive, it's rather provocative, I would say. It must come to an end if this 
uh, truth is going to be respected. However, I would like to uh, turn the focus on to that we need to also have the focus on what my colleague from uh, Ukraine just um, described in such a uh, touching manner, um, that we need to do our utmost to support in this humanitarian disaster that is taking place right now. We have heard it earlier today, several of billions of people are now in dire need of support. Uh, two million people are living in the separatist controlled area. They are in dire need of food and, and other kind of help. We have more than a million of internally displaced people, which Ukraine is trying to do their best to, to help, but they need our support. There is 500 thousand people living in basements without any heater and, and in need of almost everything. So I urge you, my colleagues, to do the same as we are doing, to urge our governments to be helpful and supportful to Ukraine, to, to uh, supply them with every kind of support to help the people which are now in a humanitarian disaster. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kent. <clears throat> and we move forward. Uh, the next speaker is Mrs. Barbara Bartos, followed by Mr. Cedo Chapadais from Georgia. Now, Mrs. Bartos. You can do Mr. Chergil, colleagues, this is not a regional config anymore. This is a regular war and a humanitarian catastrophe. It changed the peaceful coexistence and the security architecture built for decades in the OSCE region. Therefore, a determined and cohesive reaction to breaking of the international law by Russia and separatists is a matter of our credibility. The situation in eastern Ukraine has rapidly deteriorated. Russia and the separatists have consolidated their power and launched a full-scale offensive. European and Euro-Atlantic community should prepare for a serious debate on the nature and prospects of relations with Russia, especially after the escalation of fighting in eastern Ukraine. We should also prepare for another conflict which may spread out easily beyond the current front line. Currently, there is no point in reaching out to Moscow with positive signals unless Russia is ready to stop interfering in Ukrainian affairs. Any further escalation on, of the conflict on the part of separatists should lead to widening and deepening of the sanctions regime, not only visa ban, an asset freeze list, but also broadening of the sectoral sanctions. On the other hand, further comprehensive political and economic support for Ukraine, based on the principle more support for more reforms, is badly needed. Poland is actively contributing to OSCE efforts with personnel and resources. We will continue our support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then uh, Mr. Tedo Chapadais and then... Uh, Mr. Andreas Aebi and uh, Doris Barnett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At the outset, let me reiterate a well-known position of Georgia that in that tragic crisis in and around Ukraine, we firmly support the sovereignty and territorial integrity of that state. We reported fall of the Ukrainian town of Debaltsev where the Minsk II ceasefire was ridiculed rather than merely undermined. In good faith, Europe hoped that agreement would be the basis for a more comprehensive permanent solution. However, the basic fault of the ceasefire agreement remains. The Russian Federation refuses to assume responsibility for its part in the conflict and thereby its responsibility to upholding the means to agreement or any other agreement. This lack of faith is not unknown to Georgia. We have encountered the same kind of maneuvers. When separatist forces were saved by so-called volunteers, some un un unidentified little green men, now the same volunteers have changed the entire landscape of a sovereign country. 
Neither the United Nations nor the OSCE could monitor, let alone restrain, troops that do not have distinguishing marks. Peacekeeping, ceasefires, diplomacy as such are impossible to conceive without sovereign entities that assume responsibility for their actions. And whenever it won't happen, any peacemaking efforts would transfigure into peacekeeping endeavors to keep this piece of land or territories or the other ones. We need to remember that observing rules is ultimately a prerequisite for diplomacy. If no legal principles are upheld, the world will understand that there is no future for diplomatic conflict resolution when dealing with Russia. That is a dangerous lesson to learn, this lesson that Europe has spent 40 years trying to unlearn. This is a lesson that the USSR did learn and did honor when yeah. during the Cold War. This is a lesson that the Russian Federation Thank is you. to recall for its own benefit. Thank you. And looking at the panel and at distinguished ambassadors, you know, Thank you. I think that we need to give the chance to diplomacy one more time. Thank you. Yes. And now, <clears throat> Andreas Ayabi from Switzerland, please. And, uh, Followed by Mrs. Herr Vorsitzende, Kolleginnen und Kollegen, das Ende der Gewalt und Bemühungen um eine politische Lösung des Konflikts in und um die Ukraine tut Not. In den letzten Wochen hatte sich die Lage insbesondere für die zivile Bevölkerung massiv verschlechtert. Es kam zum Beschuss von zivilen Autobussen, Wohnquartieren, Spitälern und Kindergärten. Dabei wurden Zivilisten getötet. Diese Vorfälle sind aufs Schärfste zu verurteilen und wir fordern alle Seiten mit Nachdruck dazu auf, das humanitäre Völkerrecht zu respektieren. Wie die OSZT Sonderbeobachtungsmission, die SMM, in den Tagen nach dem Beginn der Waffenruhe berichtete, wurde diese mehrheitlich eingehalten. In ihrem gestrigen Bericht führte die Mission wieder vermehrt Zwischenfälle auf. Trotz dem Rückgang der Gewalt wurde in der Gegend Debalze weiterhin hart gekämpft. Den oszt beobachtern wurde der Zugang verwehrt. Anstatt die Kampfhandlungen wie vereinbart einzustellen, wurde an diesem Ort weiterhin geschossen. Menschen starben und Gebiete wurden erobert. Die Minsker Vereinbarungen müssen nun vollumfänglich und ohne weiteren Aufschub umgesetzt werden. Dies betrifft in erster Linie den Waffenstillstand, aber auch den Abzug schwerer Waffen, die laut den Vereinbarungen bereits hätte eingeleitet werden sollen. Herr Vorsitzender, trotz diesen Rückschlägen, das Maßnahmepaket von Minsk von letzter Woche ist eine Chance, endlich eine politische Lösung des Konflikts voranzubringen. Die Umsetzung ist jedoch äußerst anspruchsvoll und eine große Herausforderung, der sich die OSZD stellen muss. Es reicht aber nicht einfach, der SMM einen Auftrag zu erteilen. Der Mission müssen auch die nötigen Mittel und genügend qualifiziertes Personal zur Verfügung stehen. Ohne genügend Beobachter kann die Mission den Waffenstillstand nicht glaubwürdig beobachten und ohne adäquate Mittel kann die Sicherheit der Beobachter nicht gewährleistet werden. Die OSZ die OSZT leistet einen konkreten yes. Beitrag zum Krisenmanagement in der Ukraine. Und die Parlamentarische so. Versammlung trägt als Organ für den Austausch zwischen den gewählten Volksvertretern zum besseren Verständnis und zur vergiften Zusammenarbeit bei. Ich rufe alle Mitglieder minutes, der PA dazu please. auf, nicht nur hier in unseren Debatten die OSZT mit Worten zu unterstützen, sondern alles dafür zu unternehmen, dass die Organisation bestmöglich yeah. dafür gerüstet ist, einen Beitrag für Frieden und Stabilität in der Ukraine yes, please. zu leisten. Please. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And then Doris Barnet, followed by Vladimir Senko from Belarus. Vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Nach Helsinki 1975 und der Deutschen Wiedervereinigung 1990 hätte doch keiner hier im Saal geglaubt, dass es je wieder Krieg in Europa geben könnte. Aber leider war der Zerfall Jugoslawiens schon ein Fingerzeig, dass der Friede eine Illusion sein kann, weil überwunden geglaubte Feindschaften, verdeckte Animositäten immer noch schnell in Gewalt umschlagen können. Wir alle haben uns den Grundsätzen des Völkerrechts der USA 
OSZE der Menschenrechte von 1948 verpflichtet. Und die, wenn wir dies nicht täten, würden wir im Chaos enden, so wie es jetzt ja leider in Teilen der Ukraine der Fall ist. Unsere Regierungen entscheiden über Sanktionen, über Waffenlieferungen, über die Umsetzung von Minsk. Aber wir Delegierte, wir Abgeordnete unseres Volkes, wir müssen die menschliche Dimension im Auge haben. Wir müssen dafür sorgen, dass ihre Interessen im Vordergrund stehen. Und deshalb bitte ich die russischen Delegierten, helfen Sie mit, machen Sie dieser Farce von Prozess gegen Frau Savchenko ein Ende und lassen Sie sie frei. Und sorgen Sie dafür, dass die OSZE allen Waffen, die den Waffenstillstand beobachten soll und den Waffenabzug, dass sie ihre Arbeit machen können. Und alle beide rufe ich auf, äh, kümmern Sie sich um den Gefangenenaustausch. Es gibt Mütter und Kinder die auf ihre, und Frauen, die auf ihre Männer und Väter warten. Äh, kümmern Sie sich darum, dass, die Flüchtlinge, dass es den Flüchtlingen gut geht, dass ihnen geholfen wird. Niemand lebt in solchem Elend wie die jetzigen Flüchtlinge. Und vor allem lassen Sie die Regierungen nicht über die Bezahlung von Energiekosten streiten. Es sind nicht leere Räume, die Licht und Heizung brauchen. Es sind Menschen wie wir, denen geholfen werden muss, die unsere Unterstützung brauchen. Und ganz zum Schluss, alles, was in der Ukraine bisher passiert ist, wird aufgearbeitet werden müssen, um den Heilungsprozess in diesen beiden Ländern überhaupt wieder voranzutreiben. Danke. Thank you. Next speaker, <coughs> Vladimir Senko from Belarus, then Dean Allison and Ismato Sokolov. Uh, спасибо, господин председатель. Прежде всего, хотел бы выразить признательность швей швейцарскому председательству. Uh, трехсторонней контактной группе во главе с послом Тельявини, миссии во главе с послом Апакам за их неустанные усилия по урегулированию украинского кризиса. Думаю, нас всех находящихся в этом зале объединяет вера и надежда в то, что договоренности, достигнутые в Минске 12 февраля между руководителями четырех государств, заработают реально и будут способствовать прекращению огня и установлению мира на украинской земле. Беларусь намерена и впредь делать все от нее зависящее, чтобы кризис на территории соседней очень близкой и дружественной нам страны был разрешен как можно быстрее. Вы знаете, что тысячи людей бежали от ужасов войны. Более 60 тысяч из них нашли убежище в Беларуси. Власти и простые граждане моей страны делают все для того, чтобы обеспечить украинским беженцам достойные условия жизни. Мы будем и далее оказывать все необходимое содействие для продолжения переговоров в Минске в любых форматах. При этом я хотел бы отчетливо подчеркнуть, что Беларусь не ограничивает свой вклад в разрешение кризиса лишь предоставлением переговорной площадки. В урегулировании конфликта Минск занимает весьма активную позицию, а руководство страны вносит заинтересованным сторонам конкретные предложения. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Then Mr. Dean Allison from Canada, followed by Mr. Ismo Sokola from Finland. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and fellow delegates. Thank you for the opportunity to take part in this important debate. Canada has a close relationship with Ukraine since we became the first Western nation to recognize its independence on December 2nd, 1991. Since the crisis began in November 2013, Canada has supported the Ukrainian people's fight for democracy and reform, the country's continued resistance to Russia's military aggression in Crimea and eastern Ukraine, and its government's ongoing and important reform efforts. We provided over $420 million to help Ukraine stabilize its economy and support key reforms, and announced over $132 million in bilateral development assistance projects. My fellow parliamentarians, as our Assembly's resolution on clear, gross, and uncorrected violations of Helsinki principles by the Russian Federation makes clear the crisis in Ukraine threatens the foundational values of the OSCE. In Basel last December, Canada's foreign minister stressed that we will never ever recognize Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. The Russian Federation must de-escalate the crisis. Russia must also respect Ukraine's sovereignty and its territorial integrity. I agree with the G7 leaders that the implementation of the Minsk Pact 
offers a way forward to a comprehensive, sustainable, and peaceful resolution to the crisis in eastern Ukraine. When it became clear that Russia and its proxies were not respecting the ceasefire, especially around Dzbozova, Canada imposed new sanctions. These were announced on February 17th. If the Minsk agreement are not respected, the cost for Russia will continue to increase. I just want to conclude my statements with the statement that our Prime Minister said to Mr. Putin when he was at the G20 in Australia, and it was just simply, get out of Ukraine. Thank you. And, um Also, for the perfect timing, uh, then Mr. Sokola from Finland, followed by Mr. Lord Bonus from UK. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the crisis in Ukraine has strained the relations between Western countries and Russia with an unforeseeable force. And because of the influx of this, is, this information, it's very difficult to know exactly what is really going happening in that re region. Western unity is indispensable as far as the sanctions are concerned. I do not believe that the sanctions and counter sanctions will help us to solve the crisis, and at least in the Euro EU countries would do quite well without them in this current economic situation. Sanctions have, however, been inevitable. Europe does not accept Russian actions. Illegal actions have their consequences. At the times, defending our own values will cost and will hurt, but we must be ready to pay the price. Today, public opinion is Achilles' heel of the West. We have to do much more than to persuade the people of our countries of need for strong defense and the importance of meaningful commitment to alliances at the time of real security threat. The reluctance of many Western governments to fulfill even minimal defense obligations must have been noticed in Kreml too. And we need to get through the Russian people more effectively to tell them what is really happening in their name. The tension between Western countries and Russia has been painful for countries like Finland who wants to cherish good relationship to both directions. We aligned politically and economically to the Western liberal, liberal democracies many decades ago, but we have always wanted and still do want to maintain and cherish our good re and friendly relationship to Russia also in our eastern neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Lord Paulus, UK, and uh, Asai Guliev from Azerbaijan, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Perhaps one of the saddest memories of this meeting will be the group of many young people standing outside our meeting concerned about the situation in their country, Ukraine. And if you spoke to any of them, they were wondering how long the conflict would go on and worrying about their homeland and family. And none of us if we were honest, could give them an answer. And all this in 2015 in a Europe which is supposed to have turned its back on war. The United Kingdom supports all efforts to seek a political and negotiated settlement and observance of the Minsk agreements. We've given limited assistance to the Ukrainian government. We've made it clear that any decision to provide defensive weapons has not been taken at this time. But we do reserve the right to reconsider that decision in the future. In this assembly, President, we emphasize the need for dialogue, but we won't serve our cause if uh, in that dialogue we do not speak frankly and tell participating states, which have broken every important principle of Helsinki, that they're wrong and their behavior is unacceptable. The situation in Ukraine requires the Russian Federation to understand the vast majority of us believe they're acting outside the norms we've come to expect and hope for in 2015. We can't be expected to believe without question that the coverage of the weaponry being deployed in Ukraine has been acquired by a few separatists who had it stored away in cellars and barns waiting for an opportunity. Am I to believe that the Royal Air Force has been imagining the warplanes buzzing our space, airspace and the airspace of the Baltics. For the European Union, there's a clear message. Uh, we need a foreign policy 
that, and it has to have credibility. We may need to take measures that appear contrary to our own national interest, but to ensure support for those who may suffer in the common interest. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Then Mr. Azai Muliev from Azerbaijan, followed by William Alagnate from Lithuania. Thank you, Mr. President. The crisis in and around Ukraine, with its harsh consequences, especially killing of thousands of people, turning hundreds of thousands of civilians into internally displaced persons, disruption of territorial integrity as well as threats against Ukrainian sovereignty following the military operations in its eastern part remains source of extreme concern. High-level negotiations within the Normandy format, which resulted in a ceasefire agreement, is very encouraging development. We hope that the recent ceasefire agreement means we not have similar faith to the one that was previously agreed last September. We call on conflicting parties to take practical steps to find durable and comprehensive solution to the issues that underlie the ongoing crisis through peaceful means and without further delay. The only viable way of achieving sustainable settlement of the conflicts and crisis in the OEC area, including the one that threatens stability and unity of Ukraine, is strict adherence to the Helsinki Final Act and the principles guiding interstate relations enshrined therein without double standards and any preferences. Refraining from threat or use of force against territorial integrity or political independence of each other and respect for the sovereignty of all states are fundamental principles upon which our organization is built on and any attempt to challenge these principles must be rejected. I wish to conclude with the hope that wisdom will prevail and the parties will find durable solution to the crisis on the basis of these principles, particularly the territory integrity of sovereignty of Ukraine with a view to restoring peace and stability in this magnificent country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and then, Vilya Alkanaite from Lithuania and Denis uh, Lukham from Belgium. Dear colleagues, it's ironical that commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Act, the Kremlin has sent us a bloody invitation to the funeral of this essential international document. We are dealing with conscious and deliberate disregard of all OEC norms and principles which were caused by Russian aggression against Ukraine and also against all European security architecture. <coughs> the Kremlin and our colleagues from Duma continuously deny Russia's involvement in the new war, but this mimicry leads only to further moral and political isolation of Russia. The so-called conflict has not been internal, but very external, and it is more than obvious. We welcome each window of opportunity to end it, but the main result of numerous diplomatic attempts, agreements, and high-level meetings in Minsk and Berlin leads to the conclusion that no deal with Mr. Putin and Kremlin has a credibility and real value. It's obvious the OEC cannot continue its business as usual because you cannot build a house with those who are destroying and exploding it from the inside. I fully agree with the uh, remark of Mr. John Kerry uh, made in Basel. When rules are broken, they need to be enforced, not rewritten. So, back to the rules. Back to the Helsinki principles. This is my message. And there is no space for any discussions about the new European security order while aggression is still in action. Thank you very much. Thank you, William. And uh, the next speaker, Denis Ducharme, Belgium, followed by Mrs. Liv Holm Andersen, Denmark. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. C'est du charme, pas du charme, mais vous faites honneur. Euh, je tenais à remercier euh, les orateurs principaux pour, euh, pour leur action euh, et aller dans leur sens. En effet, nous n'avons plus, plus à parler de, de crise ukrainienne. Nous devons parler de, de conflits, de guerre. L'Europe euh, euh, n'est plus en paix. Euh, et nous devons demeurer pleinement fermes sur, euh, sur les principes, euh, continuer à condamner euh, la violation de la souveraineté ukrainienne, euh, la violation de son intégrité territoriale. Rappelez, comme l'a fait euh, la Belgique qui préside actuellement le Conseil de l'Europe, la position européenne en la matière, euh, continuer à travailler ensemble au niveau européen euh, sur la question. Et même si euh, l'effroi euh, nous étreint, euh, eh bien la relance... Euh, du dialogue est essentiel. Elle est essentielle et, et nous ne pouvons dans ce cadre-là que euh, saluer, soutenir le travail et l'engagement de, de l'OSCE, le travail naturellement de la mission d'observation, l'OSCE qui veille au respect des accords de Minsk, des mesures de mise en œuvre, vont veiller naturellement à garantir au mieux le respect du droit humanitaire, louer aussi la, le travail de la présidence serbe et, et le concours de la Biélorussie. Euh, continue à nous engager dans la feuille de route tournée vers la liberté soutenue il y a deux jours par les Nations Unies, soutenir encore le travail du format de Normandie, appeler la Russie à poursuivre pleinement, entièrement, sur cette voie, enfin appeler dans le respect de l'ensemble des composantes de sa population au respect des choix d'avenir d'une Ukraine libre. Well, thank you. Now we have Ms. Liv Holm Anderson, followed by Mr. Luigi Compagna. Ms. Liv Holm Anderson, please. Thank you very much. What is happening in Ukraine is definitely the worst crisis in Europe since the war in ex Yugoslavia. And it's a war that already has more victims than the war in Croatia in 1992. And everybody who are not directly affected are affected indirectly. I could spend time now in my speech shaming Russia's behavior as the aggressor in this war, but I would rather uh, talk a little bit about what the OSCE is actually doing in this war. Because that's a lot, and I think as the parliamentary assembly of the, this organization, we should spend time focusing on this. So I have two substantial questions for my Russian fellow parliamentarians. Um, the OSCE would like to observe more places uh, in the Russian-Ukrainian border, and they would like better condition to actually do this. So my question is, why can't Russia allow them to do this? What is Russia trying to hide? Another question is that the OEC uh, would like to do more mission in uh, Lugansk and Donetsk regions without being followed all the time by Russia sympathizing separatists. Could Russia help in this? Could they help smooth things over? And if not, if no is the answer, why are, why are, are, are Russia making obstacles here? Uh, what are Russia and the Russia sympathizing separatists trying to hide here? I could go on with more examples on how there's put obstacles to the OSCE's mission in, in Ukraine. So these are just my questions to sum up. I really hope that I will get answer to these questions, if not in this debate, then maybe in later debates on this specific topic, subject later on. Thank you. We thank you. Now we have Mr. Luigi Compagna, followed by Diana Bukomanovic. Grazie, Presidente. Fra Ukraina e Russia, i rapporti sono complicati e antichi. Ma quasi mai questi rapporti hanno assicurato sovranità ed integrità territoriale piena dell'Ucraina. Erano però rapporti che risalgono ai tempi nei quali l'OSCE non c'era. La nostra organizzazione nasce alla metà degli anni 70, Helsinki più 40 appunto, e nasce nel presupposto che ogni Stato nazionale abbia diritto a confini riconoscibili e riconosciuti in diritto internazionale. Insomma, per restare nella storia d'Europa, nel 1975 c'era ancora 
in molti stati un regime comunista però dopo Helsinki si voleva affermare che a nessuno sarebbe più capitato come era capitato all'Ungheria nel 1956 e alla Cecoslovacchia nel 68 di vedere nel proprio territorio carri armati tanto attivi come quelli che allora passarono i confini dei due paesi. Per Rosce quel che accade da, da circa un anno in, un in Ucraina, tra Plasmaida e Minsk, è decisivo per la nostra funzione, per la nostra organizzazione, per la nostra credibilità. Mai più Budapest 56, mai più Praga 68. Ecco perché quello di oggi non dovrebbe essere il momento della Nato, dell'ONU, di prestare armi difensive all'Ucraina. Dovrebbe essere il momento degli OSCE. E quindi quello che mi angoscia non sono tanto gli insulti, di cui più o meno ripetutamente il Presidente Putin è bersaglio. Mi angoscia sentire talvolta che Putin abbia definito la dissoluzione dell'Unione Sovietica, cioè del comunismo, una catastrofe. No, il comunismo è stato un incubo nella storia d'Europa. Nessuna politica di imperialismo nazionale russo può ridare credibilità a quel momento storico. Grazie. Now we have Ms. Diana Vukomanovic from Serbia, followed by Ms. Um, Ivana Dobresova from Czech Republic. We parliamentarians from Serbia are also expressing our full support and backing to Minsk's package of agreement and measures to be implemented in line with the support that was already given by all of us. Mediation and active role of the OSCE in Ukrainian crisis is very important but very complex jobs to be done. Tremendous responsibility is ahead of all of us uh, and this responsibility is of historic importance. And that is why all of us should express our full support to those brave people, members of the special monitoring mission led by Ambassador Apakan, as well as of the observer mission led by Mr. Paul Picard. We are encouraging OSCE representatives to engage all peacemaking tools to cooperate with local and central authorities in Ukraine at all levels, as well as with civil society, ethnic and religious groups, and local population to facilitate peace dialogue and build trust among the people on the ground. Since all of us know that problems can't be solved by weapons, only by people, Europe's recipe for success is dialogue. But the words are not enough to help the people in this region. We should invest much more resources, especially financial resources, to help the people in Ukraine during the current conflicting phase, but especially during the post-conflict cycle of recovery and reconciliations. We should start to speak, elaborate the future of the people of Ukraine now. Thank you. Now comes uh, Ms. Ivana Dobesova from Czech Republic, followed by Mr. Edwin Snore from Latvia. Uh, thank you very much, dear Mr. Chairman, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. The Czech Republic welcomes the new ceasefire agreement, which was signed on the 12th of February in Minsk. We hope that it will, unlike the original ceasefire from September 2014, last and finally put an end to the deadly violence ranging in the eastern Ukraine. We are very concerned about the situation in the Balcheve, where fighting is still continuing and lots of dead or injured persons have been left on the spot without any help. We believe that the stability in the region is crucial not only for security in the Central Europe, but also for security in the whole European Union. The Czech Republic supports the efforts of the OVCE to find a political situation uh, in, uh, to the Ukraine crisis based on respect from the sovereignty of the Ukraine and its territorial integrity. 
we high, highly value the important role which the OECE has played in contributing to the de-escalation of the crisis in and around Ukraine. The OEC should also play a key role in the effective and comprehensive monitoring of the Ukraine-Russia state border by the Special Monitoring Mission, which is one of the key tasks in support of the implementation of Minsk Agreement. The Czech Republic supports Ukrainian aspirations and efforts on its way of de democratization, implementation of necessary political and economic reforms and countrywide consolidation. We remain ready to share in this regard our own experience with its transformation gained in the past. The Czech Republic also places great emphasis on addressing the hum humanitarian situation in eastern Ukraine and I would like to mention that the Czech Republic is one of the five countries within the EU that contribute most in this respect. The humanitarian help includes medical supplies for local hospitals, providing medical care for civilians during the winter through mobile medical clinics, donating winter equipment and clothing for internally displaced person, person as well as arranging house recovery stays for their children in the Czech Republic. In cooperation with NGOs, we are currently preparing to send a convoy with humanitarian aid to the Ukraine. Also, the Czech Czech Republic is ready to receive wounded civilians from eastern Ukraine. I am very proud of that fact that we are helping Ukrainian people in this way. But believe me that I would be much happier if there was no reasons to send the humanitarian help uh, uh, whatsoever. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Now comes Mr. Edwin Snorre from Latvia, then followed by Ignacio Sanchez Amor from Spain. Dear colleagues, mm -hmm. Mr. Pushko told us just now that the Ukrainian forces had shelled Donetsk. If we open the news, even the Russian news, we can read in black and white that the OSCE observers on the ground reported that it was not Ukrainian forces, but Russian-backed separatists who were responsible for this shelling. Russia is constantly trying to distort the reality in Ukraine. It tries to fool the world that it is not a party in this conflict. But we all know that Russia is a party in this war. And it looks like Mr. Putin doesn't even want peace. He wants to subdue Ukraine, whatever it takes, even if he had to drown it in blood. We must not let that happen. During the past century, there has already been time when the world stood by and watched how seven million Ukrainians were deliberately starved to death by the Kremlin in the man-made famine. Ukrainian nation has gone through unimaginable suffering. We must help them now so that the loss of innocent life is stopped. I call on the OSCE members, and especially on the Great Britain and America, the countries which guaranteed the territorial integrity of Ukraine by signing the Budapest Memorandum, help Ukraine to fight against the foreign aggression, give military aid to Ukraine, which it so badly needs, if Putin is not stopped now, the bloodshed will continue, and all those innocent souls will be on our conscience if, what, if we once again will just stand by and watch how Ukrainians die. Thank you. Thank you. Now comes Mr. Ignacio Sanchez Amor from Spain, followed by an Emin Onen from Turkey. Gracias, Doris. Una consideración humanitaria, el, el dolor en nombre de todos los españoles por la pérdida de vidas, porque a veces en la frialdad de estos pasillos no se repara en ese aspecto humanitario. Una consideración moral, compartimos el valor de la absoluta libertad de las opiniones, pero también compartimos el valor de la verdad de los hechos como incontrovertibles. Y voy a las cuestiones políticas. La OSCE ha entrado en las casas de muchas personas del mundo, en los telediarios, a raíz de la desgraciada situación de Ucrania. Es una situación desgraciada, pero es una oportunidad para nuestra organización para legitimarse ante el mundo. Y en este marco tenemos dos plusvalías. Primera plusvalía, estamos allí. Allí hay observadores, casi 300 observadores, a los que creo que hay que rendir homenaje desde la comunidad de estos salones de Viena. Segunda plusvalía, 
los colegas rusos están sentados entre nosotros. Y esa presencia nos da un papel relevante y una ventaja comparativa respecto de otras organizaciones internacionales. Y nos da el derecho a criticar abierta y francamente a los colegas que se sientan entre nosotros como nosotros podemos ser criticados igualmente eh, por ellos. Pero al tenerles aquí y poder criticarles, eso también crea una responsabilidad paralela y consecuente. Podemos criticar, pero tenemos que escuchar las opiniones que ellos emitan. Y vuelvo a los valores. Estoy dispuesto a escuchar las justificaciones de los colegas rusos, sus opiniones y sus puntos de vista, pero no estoy dispuesto a ser tratado como un menor de edad respecto de los datos y de los hechos incontrovertibles que todos conocemos. Y a veces, desgraciadamente, nuestros colegas rusos se deslizan peligrosamente por esa pendiente. Estoy dispuesto a escuchar y a evaluar opiniones y posiciones políticas, pero no a tragar en este salón con la un, papilla propagandística que se debe utilizar para eh, audiencias mucho menos preparadas que las que estamos aquí. Aquí no. Aquí no estoy dispuesto a considerar el cinismo sobre los hechos como una actitud legítima. Gracias. Thank you. Now comes Mr. Emin Onen, followed by Ms. Arte Dade from Albania. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Ukraine crisis has posed the gravest challenge to European security and stability in recent history and challenged the basic principles our security architecture is built upon. It has been a human tragedy for the people of, of Ukraine. The Ukraine crisis has also emphasized the relevance of our organization in an environment increasingly characterized by risks and challenges. And I believe it, it's safe to say that through the combined efforts of the OEC and its parliamentary assembly, the organization has definitely proven its worth in this regard. The special monitoring mission is without doubt the centerpiece of the OEC's engagement in Ukraine. The SMM's swift establishment in the midst of the Ukraine crisis as the first new OEC mission in over a decade showed that the OEC is very much capable of action when it truly matters. Under, a, under the able, able leadership of Ambassador Apakan and his team, the mission has consistently met and exceeded our expectations with valuable work as our eyes and ears in the field. Allow me to reiterate my country's full support for the SMM, its leadership and its entire team, including its courageous monitors. My country supports all diplomatic efforts to bring about a solution to the problem that's respectful towards Ukraine's territorial integrity, independence, sovereignty, and the political unity in keeping with our shared OEC commitments and international law. We call on all parties to implement all the provisions of the Minsk package in good faith. I also feel the, the need to re-emphasize here how the illegitimate and illegal de facto situation in Crimea, which Turkey continues to regard as a part of Ukraine, remains a key dimension of the ongoing crisis. We continue to be gravely concerned by the human rights violations of minority groups, particularly the Crimean Tatars on the peninsula. We will continue to closely follow developments on the peninsula with a particular emphasis on the security and well-being of the Crimean Tatars, and we expect the OEC and its institutions to remain sized of the, this matter with all the assets at their disposal. I believe that we, as the Parliamentary Assembly, can and should also do more to draw attention to the plight of the Crimean Tatars in order to ensure that their democratic and human rights, as well as their fundamental freedoms, are fully respected. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Now comes Mrs. Arta Dade, followed by Ms. Uh, from Albania, followed by Mr. Franco Tatushik from Croatia. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the first term, I want to thank the Ambassador Apakan and Ambassador Tagliavini for the excellent presentation, but more so for the excellent job they are doing in Ukraine. We commend the special monitoring mission to Ukraine. We need to support and strengthen this mission in order that all documents agreed on by pairs in conflict should be implemented and the chance be given to the diplomatic solution. We all look forward to peaceable solutions, but this cannot be a one-way operation. Is Russia serious to resolve the crisis with diplomatic means? Unfortunately, what happened and is happening now and these days does not prove the opposite of all we are extremely concerned about.
What is the spirit of cooperative security? One side at the expense of the other? Definitively not. This organization should adhere to the principles on which it was created and functions. My country is a contributing one within OSCE. We will continue to be there, but we want Russia to commit itself to full implementation of package of measures all sides have agreed on and not to continue to defy OSC principles and violate international law as it was done by annexation of Crimea and violation of integrity of Ukraine. It's urgent that they stop military operations, ceasefire is a must, and withdrawal of heavy weapons, withdrawal of foreign armed forces is a must. SMM should be allowed to do the job within the mandate to monitor and verify ceasefire and this withdrawal. Thank you for your attention. I thank you. And now I have to tell you that our ambassadors, Mr. Uh, Apakan and uh, Mrs. Talialrini, they have to leave. And if you would like to make some of remarks, I please ask you to do so. So I have to un un interrupt our discussion. Mrs. Tagliarini, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to thank you for your interest, your engagement, and the support we felt throughout these two hours in this meeting hall from all of you. I would like to especially support what has been just now said by one of the delegates from Spain. I consider all, all forums, all institutions, such as the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE, in which a large part of the international community are gathered together to discuss all issues, especially also burning issues, such as Ukraine currently an important tool that we should continue to cherish, that we should continue to use. As long as we talk to each other, we still have a way to find solutions. It reflects a little bit what I feel within the trilateral contact group, which I am chairing. There are Russians, a Russian representative, a Ukrainian representative, and it's not always easy, but as long as we manage to talk, as long as we manage to even come to an agreement on how to proceed in our contact with the representative of the eastern part of Ukraine, we still have a chance to make headways. And that's how I imagine your work. I thank you for your support once more, and I believe all forms and all ways of showing interest and coming to the region, not only to Ukraine, but also to Russia, may and will support uh, a future peaceful solution of this un understandable and terrible conflict in eastern Ukraine. Thank you once more. Well, I thank you. And now Mr. Abakan, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, I wish to thank you for giving us this opportunity to address this August body. The debate has been useful to us. And I wish to thank you all for your support to the work of SMM in Ukraine. Be sure that I will bring your expression of appreciations to each and every monitor who are now functioning in the combat zone. Thank you for your understanding and thank you for your valuable support again. Well, we thank you. And we know how hard your work is and we really appreciate that. Now comes Mr. Franco Matusik and from Croatia, followed by George Zerretelli from Georgia, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I have to stress that Croatia fully supports sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. At the same time, we fully support the initiative of two European leaders, Ms. Merkel and Mr. Roland, and the outputs of Minsk agreement. Although Russian Federation and pro-Russian separatists 
have violated it it's only a few days after signing it. But at the same time, we, as I think and I believe, as important international organization, should send clear, unambiguous message to the leaders of Russian Federation. They should know, although they don't care, that we know that Russian military forces invaded Ukrainian territory. They should know, although they don't care, that we will never accept annexation of Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. They should know, although they don't, they don't care, that we believe in peace agreements and just solutions. And finally, they should know, although they obviously don't care, that we believe in freedom, democracy and rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. And now comes Mr. George Zeretelli from Georgia, followed by Ms. Ludmila Koslova from Russia. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, today, this morning, EPP group uh, in our assembly adopted resolution, and on behalf of this group, I'd like to present several important paragraphs as far as we don't have uh, much time. So the group considers that the Russia's support military aggression against Ukraine poses a threat to the international as well as regional peace and security. It welcomes the measures agreed by leaders of Ukraine, Germany, France and Russia and taskings to the OSC and CMM observers to ensure effective monitoring of the situation in the east of Ukraine, the area around necessary strategic railway hub of the Balseva. In this regard, we call for the extension of the OSC mission mandate and speedy enhancement of technical capabilities of the mission. Strongly condemns the violations of the ceasefire by militants acting in concert with Russian forces in the Balseva and other areas of Donbas. Calls on President of Russian Federation to exercise his influence on militants to enforce the ceasefire, to fully implement the Minsk agreements, to start the withdrawal of foreign troops and weapons from the territory of Ukraine and heavy weapons from the territory in conflict. Urges the participating states of the OSC and OSCPA to continue intensify diplomatic pressure on Russian Federation to abide fully by its international obligations and OSC principles and commitments which have proved their validity as the foundation for peace, security and cooperation. Urges all parties to respect human rights, particularly with regard to the civilian population and to monitor humanitarian organizations and NGOs to assist the people in need. Regards unacceptable the continuing illegal detention in Russia of a fellow parliamentarian, deputy of the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine and a member of the Ukrainian delegation to PACE, Nadia Savchenko, who was abducted from the territory of Ukraine, expresses full support and joined the call of the international community to immediately release Nadia Savchenko and other Ukrainian citizens who remain illegally detained by the Russian Federation. And last, agrees to reject any attempts to nominate any person pretending to represent Crimea or any part of Ukraine as representatives from the Russian Federation or its institutions and to prevent, where possible, within international law, the participation of any person subjected to sanctions imposed by the international community. Thank you. Thank you. Now comes Mrs. Ludmila Koslova from Russia, followed by Mr. Viktor Paul Dobre from Romania. Ms. Uh, Ms. Koslova, please. Спасибо, господин председатель. Свое выступление я хотел бы начать с просьбы ко всем выступающим по Украине. Давайте оставим эмоции и будем говорить только фактами. А теперь вспомним, с чего начиналось вооруженное столкновение в Украине. Не с Крыма, он был тогда в составе Украины. И тогда в феврале были нарушены женевские договоренности и произошел незаконный государственный переворот. Коллеги, почему вы об этом не говорите? Вопрос, что теперь по такому сценарию все страны должны идти? И скажите, пожалуйста, Пожалуйста, может ли человек, пришедший к власти, может ли та власть, пришедшая к власти, без, в результате незаконного переворота быть э, законопослушной и э, говорить правду? Далее. Почему мы забыли о людях, сидит э, украинская делегация? Мне стыдно за вас, тогда, когда не было России, о людях, которые горели в, в Одессе. 
которые горели, кто спровоцировал. И в это время власть, в это время милиция, скорая помощь не предпринимали ничто. И погибло 50 человек. Где снимки этих людей? С чего начинались события в Луганске и Донецке? И если бы люди, которые пришли, пришли к власти в Украине, согласились на федеративное устройство Украины, как это есть в Соединенных Штатах Америки, как это есть в Германии, в Швейцарии и многих других странах, то не было бы, поверьте, ни Луганска, ни Донецка. А мы не захотели этого. Это что, Россия виновата? Я вообще считаю, когда у меня в семье какие-то неприятности, я не соседи должна обвинять, а повернуться к себе и подумать, где я не права. И еще лишь некоторые факты. Конфликт на Украине признан конфликтом не международного характера. Это не Россия признала, а Международный комитет Красного Креста. Коллеги парламентарии, у меня такое ощущение, что вы слушаете, но не слышите. Я вас очень прошу услышать обе стороны. И понимать, когда высказано противоположное мнение, то правда где-то в середине. Что касается обстрелов гражданского населения, то миссия ОБСЕ, проводя мониторинг, сделала заключение, что обстрелы велись с позиции, которые занимались, занимали украинские войска. Конечно, трудно признать собственные ошибки. Для этого, для этого надо обладать большим мужеством, но хотя бы не передергивать факты, не обманывать тех, кто не знает ситуации, верит вам. А я обращаюсь ко всем парламентариям. У вас достаточно опыта, знаний, чтобы действительно понять, всех понять. И там, где можно предъявить претензии к России, предъявляйте. Но не забывайте, что в любом конфликте есть не одна сторона виноватая, но в том, что произошло в Украине, я очень хотела бы, чтобы вы поняли, именно виновата власть, которая пришла к власти неконституционным Please. путем. Please. И, Come пожалуйста, что касается вот поплакать, то я хотела бы госпожу Хану Хопкову пригласить поплакать в Россию, посмотреть тех беженцев, которые Please. находятся там. И не хотели мы привозить эти Please снимки, мы считали это пропагандой. Я прошу э, э, вас Please. всех еще раз прислушаться. Like Спасибо. Thank you. Now comes Mr. Viktor Paul Dobre from Romania, followed by Lukasz Krupta from Poland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, Romania fully supports a peaceful solution in Ukraine that must respect the sovereignty, territorial integrity, unity and independence of Ukraine. These are fundamental principles that must be respected by all countries. We reaffirm our support for all diplomatic efforts, including those undertaken by the OSSEU and all other formats, trilateral contact group and the Normandy format for a peaceful solution in Ukraine. Full and, ur and urgent implementation of the Minsk agreements and the package of measures is essential. Russia has to make the proof of its political will by implementing these ag agreed provisions. An essential element is the withdrawal of heavy armaments, mercenary, military equipment and military forces that should be monitored by the OCCA Special Monitoring Mission, along with the ceasefire monitoring. The reports of the Special Monitoring Mission confirm the presence of a substantial amount of heavy military equipment in separatist control areas. The OCCA mission play an important role on the ground. Romania strongly supports its continuation, contribu contributing with 22 monitors on the ground. The crisis in and around Ukraine has alerted not only Romania, but the entire democratic community. We condemn the illegal annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation, which we do not recognize. We call on Russia, Russian Federation to stop its support for the separatist groups and exert its influence for a peaceful 
resolution of a crisis. We encourage, encourage the Ukrainian authorities to continue the process of political and economic reform expected by the population of this country in order to advance on its European and euro Atlantic path. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you. Now comes Mr. Lukasz Grupta from Poland, followed by Franz Tönnies from Germany. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, during any conflict, uh, women, children, and elderly people are victims of fighting. The situation in Ukraine is no different. Uh, no one can deny that the humanitarian situation in Ukraine is a disaster. The newest United Nations report stat states that one million people are internally displaced and uh, five, million, uh, five millions are in a uh, an urgent need of humanitarian assistance. Civilians uh, desperately require uh, all basic products like food, water, medicines or warm clothes. Winter is still on and many households do not have no uh, hot water, gas or electricity. I welcome to agreement uh, from Minsk where the parties agreed uh, to allow access of humanitarian assistance to all areas no matter under whose uh, control. Many international uh, papers have published um, on the sad reality of lives in the fight zones. The Guardian has presented the case of town Komunar, where many houses were destroyed during the latest fight and there is no landline or gas. Moreover, the majority of people working as coal miners are paid a few months later or not at all. Uh, nevertheless, this aid needs to come from somewhere. Every state represented here has a moral responsibility to help civilians in Ukraine. Today we have a chance to discuss uh, this issue, but tomorrow when we come back to our national parliament, we should urge our uh, governments for immediately humanitarian aid for civilians. Furthermore, this aid must not be limited um, to meet only a current need. Needs. It is a high time to shift our attention uh, to the long-term rebuilding programs for towns that have been destroyed, such as a communar. What was easy to be destroyed takes double effort to be rebuilt. Thank you. Thank you. Now comes Franz Tönnies from Germany, followed by Heidi Frey from Canada. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, wir sollten heute uns alle an den 20. Februar 2014 und der Gewalt auf dem Maidan erinnern und auch der Opfer der Gewalt und ihrer Gedenken und selbstverständlich auch denjenigen, die danach ihr Leben verloren haben, verletzt wurden oder fliehen mussten. Nicht nur die Unterzeichner von Minsk haben Verantwortung für die Umsetzung der Vereinbarung, sondern auch wir Parlamentarier, die mit dem Wort dies heute und hier bestreiten und darüber streiten. Wir haben nicht nur allen OSZE-Beobachtern und allen Verhandlern zu danken, sondern auch uns in unseren Heimatparlamenten dafür zu sorgen, dass die Vereinbarungen umgesetzt werden und dass die vereinbarten Aufgaben auch von der OSZE übernommen werden. Je länger der Konflikt dauert, umso schlechter ist das für die Menschen in Russland, ist das für die Menschen in der Ukraine, ist das für alle Menschen in Europa. Deshalb muss die sofortige Waffenruhe jetzt implementiert werden und auch die Umsetzung von Minz erfolgen. Alle, die sich nicht daran halten, handeln im Widerspruch zu den Unterzeichnern. Alle, die sich nicht daran halten, handeln auch im Widerspruch und gegen die OSZE in ihrer Gesamtheit, uns eingeschlossen. Alle, die sich nicht daran halten, verhalten sich gegen die Zivilbevölkerung, die endlich friedlich leben will. Lösungen erfordern Deeskalation. Waffenlieferungen sind das nicht. Das gilt genauso für die Waffen, die über die russisch-ukrainische Grenze kommen, wie sogenannte Urlauber. Das gilt aber ebenso für die freiwilligen Bataillons in der Ukraine, die verlorene Gebiete wieder zurückerobern wollen. Lösungen erfordern auch Deeskalation in den Medien und in der Sprache, wenn Frieden gefunden und gelebt werden soll.
Dazu brauchen wir interparlamentarische Dialoge. Und es ist gut, dass Doris Barnett dies angeregt hat und dass man sich jetzt in Deutschland, in der Grenzregion zu Frankreich, mit Vertretern von Russland und der Ukraine trifft und diesen Dialog führen will. Und ich glaube, wir können dies fortsetzen in der Grenzregion zwischen Deutschland und Dänemark. Für die parlamentarische Arbeit haben wir Prinzipien, und deshalb müssen auch die Prinzipien von Helsinki wieder in Europa gelebt werden, von uns allen, vor allem aber auch von Russland. Denn es ist unser Europa, es ist unser Europa mit Russland, mit der Ukraine und Sicherheit kann es nur miteinander und nicht gegeneinander geben. Sicherheit kann man nur erreichen, wenn wir es wollen. Die Historie, die muss aufgearbeitet werden. Aber jetzt hat die Umsetzung von Minsk mit Hilfe der OSZE absoluten Vorrang, dass wieder Vertrauen entstehen kann. Vielen Dank. Jetzt kommt. Uh, no, thank you very much. Now comes Hedi Fry, followed by Emma uh, Fattorini from It Italy. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say that, that Canadian parliamentarians are all united in support for, the, for Ukraine's efforts toward democracy. Uh, we are aware that World War I and World War II began uh, because of political regional conflict in Europe. Many Canadians died and gave their lives in World War I and World War II. We do not want to see any further escalation or chance of this kind of war occurring. We're concerned about escalation of, of violence, of, of heavy arms, and of human rights in, in, in this area. We agree that Russia has violated the 1994 Budapest Agreement that promised to respect the sovereignty of Ukraine's territory in return for its, its giving up of nuclear arms. We'll also note that this is a violation of Article 2, Section 4 of the United Nations Charter. Canadian parliamentarians have no choice but to increase economic sanctions against Russia and to include in that certain banks from the SWIFT network. We also wish to increase our economic support for Ukraine, not only morally and with funds, but also by increasing and lifting trade barriers and increasing trade with Ukraine. The security of OSCE nations are at stake here, and we must act immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Ms. Emma Fattorini, followed by Ms. Natalia Ahafonova from Ukraine. Grazie, Presidente. Gli accordi di Minsk sono fragili, è stato detto da tanti, ma non dobbiamo dimenticare l'importantissimo ruolo che hanno svolto la cancelliera Merkel e il Presidente Hollande, segno che l'Europa ha finalmente assunto una posizione decisiva su questo difficilissimo conflitto, là dove non riescono più a svolgerlo questo ruolo di pacificazione gli americani e i russi che sono stati invece capaci di farlo evitando a metà del secolo scorso la guerra calda. Ora invece l'Europa che mette in campo i suoi interessi, interessi che non sono solo economici, ma che nascono da alcuni principi, da alcuni caposaldi che affondano nella sua storia migliore e nella geopolitica non solo novecentesca. Uno di questi principi fondamentali è che l'Europa deve respirare con i due polmoni, quello occidentale e anche quello orientale però, e che la Russia è quel polmone. E sarebbe molto grave se invece la Russia dovesse volgere lo sguardo verso Oriente e non collaborasse ad essere la seconda gamba. Per questo sono molto d'accordo con quanto diceva il collega Sanchez e anche il collega Compagna quando ricordavano la preziosità dell'OSCE che noi ringraziamo di cuore per la missione eh, speciale che svolge sul campo ma anche per questo spazio prezioso, dicevo, in cui c'è la Russia, in cui ci siamo tutti e in cui questo nuovo concerto del meglio dell'Europa rappresentato dalla, 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 dagli accordi di Minsk ecco, possa proseguire in un terreno veramente di confronto libero, cosa che invece vedo poco anche nel dibattito di oggi. Quindi con questo auspicio e questo augurio che va nel senso dell'intervento dell della Francia e della Germania, io chiedo ai russi, a tutti noi, di esprimere il meglio dell'Europa del Novecento. Grazie. Well, thank you. Now comes Mrs. Natalia Ahafanova from Ukraine, followed by artist 
Lenin uh, from Latvia. I'm very grateful for the attention you have paid to Ukraine. It's the first time in the history during the whole time of independence of Ukraine when our state became the object of foreign aggression, which began last year from the annexation of Crimea and was hidden by the smoke screen titled Protecting of Russian Speakers. None eliminates that tomorrow Russian Federation could make the similar action against any other European country where Russian speakers live. We welcome the diplomatic efforts launched in Minsk, but instead of fulfilling the list of measures adopted in Minsk, Russian Federation troops and terrorists shelled hundreds of towns and attacked the belts of and surrounding villages. This fact once again showed that force of the law lost the law of the force. Now the fate not only of the Ukraine, but also the fate of all Europe hangs in the balance. As the annexation of Crimea and the events in the East put a big question mark on the effectiveness of global security. I would like to emphasize that we should not recognize the aggression of Russian Federation against Ukraine as local crisis. The example of Ukraine issue showed if this can be done to Ukraine, it can be done to any other country. It's not uh, only about the territorial integrity, it's about human lives. We appeal to OCE to support us in these very challenging times. Don't ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for you. For it's not only about Ukraine, it's about the rules the world abide by. Thank you. Thank you. Now comes <laughs> Mr. Artis <clears throat> Lane. Thank you. Um, maybe the ancient and Greeks then, can help me. us in excuse understanding me. this war. Uh, you will remember they said that uh, nothing changes in history except form. Well, I would like to draw some parallels between what happened in the Baltic states 75 years ago and in Crimea. In the Baltic states, true, we didn't have little green men, but we had overwhelming Soviet forces, th thousands of tanks roll across the border. And then, believe it or not, we had a referendum election where 97 of of percent of the people in all three Baltic states at the same time decided to join the Soviet Union. And in Crimea it was also 97 percent. And Russia is the successor state to the Soviet Union. It has not apologized for that referendum and in the Baltic states. Why? And it has not denounced the occupation. Why? Think about it. Why? And uh, now, what is our strategy towards the uh, Ukraine, really? I would like to say, as soon as Crimea was annexed, which country was the first to put boots on the ground in the Baltic states and Poland? Guess any answers? America, of course, from a base in Italy. Now, uh, what is our strategy towards Ukraine when it is fighting for its survival? Is it Minsk I and then Minsk II? Is it Minsk III? and then Minsk four, and we will only have monitors to see every time if the peace that has been over and over again reached is being violated. Please think about it. What are we really do doing and saying in this room? Okay, thank you. And uh, then uh, Mrs. Barbara Muradova from Azerbaijan, and uh, followed uh, by Mr. Pucho, the Borgio from uh, uh, France. Спасибо. Во время бакинской сессии мы провели очень плодотворную дискуссию вокруг событий в Украине. Были приняты документы, в которых подчеркнута значимость неупущения ситуации из-под контроля, а также серьезных действий для предотвращения гуманитарной катастрофы. Тогда все мы искренне верили, что ситуацию можно будет спасти. Однако за короткий период времени произошли необратимые события, которые привели к сегодняшней ситуации. С момента начала конфликта Азербайджан особо подчеркивает необходимость его разрешения только на основе принципов международного права и соблюдения территориальной целостности, потому что это наш принципиальный подход. ОБСЕ должна увеличить свою роль в разрешении этой проблемы, а также расширить посредничество в парламентском измерении. Я высоко оцениваю визиты господина Камервы в Киев 
и в Москву проведенные там переговоры. И бакинская сессия, и ход наших обсуждений в Вене указывает на то, что мы являемся не только площадкой для переговоров и диалога, но и имеем значительный потенциал для роли объективного арбитра. Нам следует оживить деятельность бакинской группы и использовать ее возможности. Инициатива, основа которой была заложена в Вене, является не только оптимальным средством для еще более активного привлечения парламентской ассамблеи к этому процессу, она помимо представителей Украины и России вовлекает и другие страны ОБСЕ. Сложно понять, почему до сих пор этот механизм не был задействован для создания нехватающего сегодня между сторонами конфликта столь необходимого диалога и понимания. Считаю, что если мы в рамках наших полномочий вплотную за Займемся привлечением сторон к диалогу, то это будет содействовать большей приверженности принятым нами документам, а также апробации новосозданных механизмов по повышению роли парламентской ассамблеи по предотвращению и разрешению конфликтов. В этой связи призываю вас, господин Канерва, предпринять активные шаги по скорейшему началу деятельности Бакинской группы. Мы и думаю, что коллеги из других стран хотели бы посодействовать эффективной работе этой группы путем активного участия. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Sayi Pojo de Porjo from France, followed by Mr. Nestor Soufrich from the... Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. <laughs> L'Europe est de retour. Les discussions de Minsk ont abouti à un accord entre Kiev et les séparatistes après les négociations en présence de François Hollande, Angela Merkel, Porochenko et pour Vladimir Poutine. Les résultats sont encore incertains, mais il a souhaité qu'une paix durable en découle. Les populations locales souffrent fortement du conflit qui a aussi hypothéqué les relations Union européenne-Russie. Russie, pays où les sanctions ont contribué à déstabiliser l'économie sans faire céder le pays et ont rendu morose toutes les entreprises européennes exportatrices vers Moscou. Mais ces discussions ont permis aux Européens de reprendre la main sur ce dossier qui les concerne au premier chef. Et c'est une bonne nouvelle d'abord pour l'Ukraine. C'est aussi une bonne nouvelle pour l'Union Européenne qui a démontré sa capacité à être à la manœuvre. Mais c'est aussi une bonne nouvelle pour la Russie, si elle le souhaite, qui peut trouver dans ce compromis une porte de sortie honorable et une issue à son tête-à-tête -tête paranoïaque avec les USA. Mais pour notre président de la République française, François Hollande, l'accord ne garantit pas un succès durable. Son échec pourrait avoir deux conséquences. La déstabilisation de l'Union européenne et de la Russie, engluée par leur affinité naturelle pour chacun des deux camps présents sur le sol ukrainien, avec les risques d'un conflit long et coûteux, et la reprise en main internationale du dossier par les États-Unis, soumis à la tentation de l'interventionnisme. Ainsi, le succès ou l'échec de ces négociations sur l'Ukraine nous indiquera si les relations entre Bruxelles et Moscou peuvent redevenir un objectif pour affronter les défis du XXIe siècle. Thank you. Next speaker. Mr. Nestor Shufrish from Ukraine and then uh, Mr. Nikolai Kovalyev from Russia. Спасибо, господин председательствующий. Я хотел бы поблагодарить сегодняшних докладчиков и в первую очередь госпожу Хайди Телевини, познакомиться с которой я имел честь 23 июня не где-нибудь, а в городе Донецке, когда накануне с Виктором Медведчуком в рамках группы переговорщиков смогли договориться о встрече контактной группы Украина-Россия ОБСЕ с представителями ДНР и ЛНР. И тогда было установлено первое перемирие, которое, к сожалению, продлилось только, 30, только до 30 июня, 7 дней. А 30 июня верховный главнокомандующий президент Украины Петр Порошенко принял решение выйти из перемирия и в военный способ урегулировать этот конфликт. И это, к сожалению, правда. На момент первого перемирия погибших было официально чуть менее 80, и мы считали это трагедией. Донбасс и его инфраструктура работали, гривня была 9,5. Сейчас же гривня почти 30, погибших 
тысячи, а может быть десятки тысяч. И разрушена наша экономика. Вот это плата за решение нашего верховного главнокомандующего. Для меня это было личной трагедией, потому что я имею честь представлять в том числе этот регион, хотя родился в Западной Украине. И сегодня мы не говорим про ответственность. Я сегодня переживаю за то, что власть прикрываясь военной риторикой, уходит от ответственности за социальные провалы и за обесценение гривны и краха нашей экономики. Почему сегодня не ратифицирован римский устав? Почему он не имплементирован в наше законодательство? Почему сегодня в годовщину Майдана никто из представителей большинства, которых люди на Майдане привели к власти, не вспомнили, что сегодня годовщина Майдана, мы не знаем, кто расстрелял этих людей. Мы требуем сегодня, чтобы международные прокуроры и исследователи нашли виновных и, при... и обязательно их наказали, кто в ней был виновен. И обратите внимание, это требует оппозиция. Я прошу еще буквально пару секунд. Мы много делали для того, чтобы мир был в нашей стране. В июле месяце мы передали в ОБСЕ свое видение разрешения конфликта, и оно заключается в предоставлении определенных, может быть, даже автономных прав. Only one second, please, I ask you. Only one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Мы не имеем другой возможности решения этого вопроса, кроме как предоставления прав этим yes. регионам. И это должно быть закреплено в Конституции. Okay. Другого пути нет. И именно в этом заключается ценность yes, Минских соглашений. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And then Mr. Nikolai Kovalyev from Russia, followed by Mr. Igor Popov from Ukraine. Спасибо, господин председатель. Уважаемые коллеги, я бы хотел начать свое выступление со слов благодарности в адрес ОБСЕ, в адрес парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ, которая, в отличие от других парламентских формирований, заняла ответственную позицию и целиком отвечает своему предназначению – обеспечение безопасности и сотрудничества в Европе. Именно поэтому мы можем откровенно говорить на этой площадке обо всем. Я должен сказать, что, конечно, Россия приветствует а, минские э, договоренности, и сейчас наша задача проследить всеми имеющимися возможностями и средствами за тем, чтобы эти договоренности были выполнены. Есть надежда на то, что именно так и будет. Первое, что я хотел подчеркнуть. Под сегодня по предложению нашего председателя Илка Канарва состоялась встреча между представителями делегации России и Украины. Мы договорились об обмене информации, представляющей взаимный интерес о том, чтобы мы расследовали случаи, которые вызывают озабоченность. Я думаю, что это только первый, важный, но только первый шаг в направлении установления мира на Украине, в котором мы все с вами заинтересованы. Вы знаете, я хотел бы, обращаясь ко всем, сказать, что странно, что мы не договорились в самом начале пути, Речь идет о том, что первоначальные Донецк и Луганск выставляли требования и просили об одном. И их просьба, по сути дела, не выходила за аналогичные просьбы, которые звучали со стороны области Венета в Италии, со стороны испанских как сейчас принято говорить, сепаратистов со стороны Каталонии, со стороны Шотландии, которая тоже просила большей самостоятельности. Люди просили об одном. Дайте больше самостоятельности, дайте возможность распорядиться теми деньгами, которые они сами заработали. В ответ, к сожалению, было принято абсолютно неверное yes. решение об обстреле, и это привело к трагедии. Надо ситуацию исправлять. So, the next speaker is Igor Popa from Ukraine, and uh, followed by Mr. Sergei uh, Yusotsky from Ukraine as well. Uh, Mr. President, dear colleagues, a key indicator for uh, political processes in any country is conducting free and fair elections. And uh, since OEC, we have a Copenhagen document which uh, regulates and which gives us uh, the highest standards in conducting elections. Last year, Ukraine conducted 
two national elections, presidential and parliamentary. I would like to thank all the delegations, all the participating states uh, for sending very professional observers in ODIR mission. You could read ODIR reports, uh, experts uh, evaluated our elections and free, as free, free and fair. Unfortunately, we didn't conduct elections in Crimea because this territory was temporarily occupied by aggressor. Uh, also, foreign terrorist fighters did not allow our voters to vote in several constituencies in the East. But I am sure these constituencies will elect their members to national parliament. Uh, in this year, in October, we plan to conduct national uh, local elections. Uh, and in October, or even earlier, we are ready to conduct local elections also in eastern part of the country, as we signed it in Minsk agreement. And we are ready for sure to invite ODIR to observe such elections, and we will invite all participating states, including Russia, to send by their quotas observers in this delegation. Uh, concerning uh, giving more responsibilities and more rights to the regions, I would like to inform that Ukrainian Parliament approving new and new legisl legislation which give more and more authorities to local self-government. But only people of Ukraine and elected representatives could decide about our constitution. And I'm surprised that uh, some other countries uh, advise so strongly the advisers about our constitution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the next speaker is Mr. Sergei Vizotsky from Ukraine, followed by Mrs. Olga Belkova from Ukraine as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair, distinguished members of the Parliamentary Assembly. Um, many words have spoken now about the situation in our country and about Russia aggression. Uh, but these words were the words of the Russian delegation to provide them facts of this aggression. We will be so kind and answer on their questions. I have here a list of paper on which stated uh, about 10 pieces of exclusively Russian uh, tanks and other armament that is uh, adopted only in Russian armor, army. Not in Ukrainian army, not in some Soviet uh, bases. These are pieces of armor and armored vehicles and tanks and uh, uh, guns could be taken. Among them are, uh, for example, uh, the kind of uh, tank that T-72 B-3. It's a uh, new modernized tank of Russia. Kamaz Vistrel, BMP Dazor, and other and other and other pieces of exclusive Russian armies are the Russian guns and uh, techniques that comes through the Ukrainian border. They ask us for some evidence, uh, but we uh, address the Russian media. For example, today, uh, the newspaper Commerçant, it's a Moscow-based newspaper, very widely spread in Russia, uh, came with a report about the Russian soldiers that were taken in Debaltsevo, and they were taking uh, uh, battle actions in Debaltsevo. And uh, Ilya Barabanov, the uh, reporter of the Commerçant, uh, gave a very uh, broad, uh, broad comment about the situation. He stresses names, he stresses the situation, and he stresses uh, uh, the conditions on which these guys and these soldiers from Russia came to Donbass and took the Baltsevo. Uh, today, Mr. Petro Poroshenko, the President of Ukraine, stated that through Maidan, the Russian aggression began not only with Crimea, but on Maidan, because he accused Mr. Vladislav Surkov, one of the close bakers of Mr. Putin, in uh, instruction the snipers that kill, um, that kill Ukrainian people people at Maidan on 20th February one year ago. Uh, we believe and our Secret Service believe uh, that the Russian troops uh, near the Baltsevo were uh, commanded by Mr. Linsov. He's a general of staff, full general of staff of, uh, of Russian infantry. And uh, he is now the, out of criminal prosecution in Ukraine. This is the facts and let's be close to the facts. To, um, to see that the Russian aggression, please help us in accusing Russia in this aggression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the last but not least uh, speaker on our list is Olga Pelkova from Ukraine as well. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the war in Ukraine is destroying lives, buildings, infrastructure, and it has very dramatic impact on our economy. Ukraine's government has for a year been fighting with Russia-backed separatists in its eastern region. The conflict has devastated our economy and forced Ukraine to need rescue loans. Military operations, just for your information, every day cost us five to ten million of dollars per day. And this is not to mention all the costs we will have to cover for helping IDPs and dis, uh, restoring uh, the region of Donetsk. The IMF last week announced a 40 billion support package for Ukraine over the next four years. It includes 17 and a half billion of IMF funding, money from the European Union, and up up to 15 billion is expected debt renegotiation by Ukraine. And this is what true friends and brothers are doing to the weak partner. They are not sending, they are not annexing part of my territory. They are not using energy resources to scare the people in my country and EU. They are not using their own money to send weapons and tanks to fuel the conflict in Donetsk. Ukraine needs OSCE and its members to stand by the value of cooperation and principles of collective, uh, collective protection. In case of economy, it means some of financial support and more efficient inclusion of the Ukraine's potential into the world economy. Be it for energy production and transporting, technology or the agriculture, I can assure you that once Ukraine is peaceful, we have a lot to offer. И для наших э, коллег из России я бы хотела сказать, что в тот день, когда вы забрали нашего президента, э, коррумпированного президента Януковича, вы должны были понимать, что он не невеста с преданным, и so, Крым к нему не прилагается. Поэтому верните нам Крым, а потом будете нас получать. I declare the special debate closed. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, <clears throat> may I say just a very, very few words by saying that one of the serious aspects in our discussion was that if it's a question about uh, larger crises in Europe, in Europe's European security architecture, and East-West relations, so that it's not a question only about Ukraine. This is one of the, of the fresh ideas in, in our discussions, if I followed it strictly. So that it means that we have to, we must continue and, and, and uh, intensify our efforts to facilitate a diplomatic solutions to the to the crisis i was very happy also to notice that uh, that uh, we will maximize our number of monitors the maximum number of the monitors will be reached very very soon that's also very important mark of the de of, of our debate uh, and um, of course I understand that uh, all of us, we, we have very clear concern for the humanitarian situation on the ground level. And uh, I do hope that uh, the working groups connected to the implementation of Minsk agreement will be set up very, very soon. Uh, all in all, I want to thank our esteemed keynote speakers. But as well uh, as all the fellow parliamentarians for their statements. Looking ahead, the PA will keep uh, working towards diplomatic solutions. This is the only way for us, diplomatic solutions, political dialogue to the crisis. And uh, we will keep implementing and, uh, and supporting concrete OECE actions what concerns Ukraine. So this is this is a long list we had have today and uh, and I'm very proud about those statements you made for for the common efforts and uh, I'm very sure that the OECE is a 
the key player in the, in the whole whole crisis to to try to promote the positive and diplomatic and political debate solutions to the crisis. So we are in the focus, and it means that we have the big, big responsibility. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, also I'm optimistic and hopeful what concerns our liaison group of this crisis, uh, mainly concerning Ukraine and Russia. We have the positive views in front of us, and, and I do hope that we can we can contribute the process in a positive way. So now I want to thank you, every one of you, and, and uh, hope that we, we can also continue in a constructive and, and positive way. I want to thank the interpreters and uh, hope that everything is going well, and we will see in the next time in Helsinki in the beginning of July and I welcome all of you to, to come to Helsinki and uh, hope to see you there. Thank you very much indeed.